Good evening. I'd like to call uh, to order the September 7th meeting of the City of Boulder Planning Board. Um, we have a full agenda tonight with three public hearings, so uh, bear with us as we work our way um, through those. Um, our first uh, item on our agenda is approval of minutes, but we don't have any this week, so we can move quickly, um, which brings us to public participation for matters not set for public hearing tonight. And just as a reminder, we have three items for public hearing. The first is 1911 11th Street in the downtown historic district. The second is 1831 22nd Street. And the third is 5505 Central. Um, and that's a concept plan and review. Um, we have three folks uh, signed up for public participation um, tonight. If others are interested, please see Cindy. Um, we have uh, three minutes apiece for uh, addressing the board tonight, given that we do have a heavy uh, load tonight and a lot of people waiting. I'm going to be pretty strict uh, about that. Um, and then it looks like we've got one person pooling, so when we get there, I'll need to just double check that the pooling folks are all here. And with that, I think the first person um, signed up to address the board is Alan Delamere. Welcome, Mr. Delamere. Good evening. Alan Delamere, 525 Mapleton. <clears throat> and as usual, I have a, uh, a PowerPoint for use. So... There it is, it's up. Now, you all uh, know the Boulder Revised Code inside out, right? And 1.114E is the thing I want to talk about today. Um, and in the course of it, we'll talk about these four topics, the processes, the public participation working group, and the impacts that's having on us, uh, responsibilities for us all, and how we form opinions. So, uh -oh. okay, what's gone wrong there? Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll give you an extra I've, 30 I've, seconds of time to reflect the delay there. So go ahead. Okay. I've studied the, all the code extensively over the last few years, and many of you that have been on the board a long time know uh, some of my previous things. Uh, basically, it's a pretty complex process, the development thing. A site plan, lousy uh, typing, uh, submission takes place the third and the third Mondays of each month and a three-week staff review takes place. And then on a Friday, they dump you with an enormous amount of homework to do between then and the next, uh, next night. Now, you know this in spades. So you've got a few days to review it, and then on that day, you deal with the pr staff presentation, developers presentation, public comments, and then you debate and decide what's going on. So that's our standard, our standard process. Now, the Public Participation Working Group report uh, suggests that we should be doing things a little bit differently. And they're suggesting that all parties should work ahead of time. And the key point is to move into the factual environment so all parties understand what's going on. What are the public gains and losses associated with something on the benefit side? What's the long-term effect on the community? Uh, does it move us uh, towards net zero? Does it attract more problems for housing and transportation? So there's lots of things. And then we get into the development plan itself, and uh, we end up with other problems. So the responsibilities that you've got in enacting ordinance to the city council, that public interest is favored over any private interest. That's uh, the key thing. The board has the reputation of being developer-friendly directly in contradiction to the above. Now, I don't believe that. I think you're normal people, and you aren't doing an honest evaluation, and you come to the right decisions. You're not going to rubber stamp whatever the staff comes up with. So you'll review the packages carefully and move forward. So uh, there is a little debate of what we mean by public and what we mean by private. You might 
look at that later and think about whether I've got the list right. And you're going to form an opinion, and do you have enough time really to do it properly? Uh, is the developer's sales job with deceptive <coughs> graphics, which I've seen on a, one particular project, is it sufficient to give you the proper thing? Um, what prior information is available before you get into this thing? Well, you know, a DAB meeting can take place. There's previous staff reports. There's lots of information, citizens' comments, lots of those. And you can visit the site and talk to citizens. And I've given you an invitation and sent you a, a site visit, for instance, a self-guided tour that I hope you've all done. Uh, so how do you evaluate the verbal comments you get? Count pros and cons? Pick up on factual statements and ask for staff verification or what? So if you can wrap up in what yeah, I suggest, I if you can send this okay. to us by email yeah. as well so we can study it. Yeah. Polarization of boulders is an issue. And uh, basically, the bottom line is how do you really look after public interest? Thank you. Great, thank you, and I do encourage I, you to send that on. Go ahead, Crystal. I had a quick question. You said we get our packet, were you meaning the planning board or city council? We get our packets on Friday, and then we have till Monday to read it and digest it and everything? Yeah, well, this is for your Thursday meeting, so you, you go from the Friday to the Thursday, I think. <laughs> oh, I thought you have Monday up there. Oh. No, Monday, uh, so, oh, maybe. Well, maybe I'll I better look it up. Cross-check my uh, time, but it's... It's Friday to Thursday is your review period, right? Thank okay. you. We usually have two weeks, so th and the public usually will have the two yeah, weeks. Yeah, you just hope well. you don't have any so. commitments for that weekend, right? Okay. Thank Enjoy you. the job. Um, thank you, Mr. Delamere. Uh, next up is Jacqueline Muller. <clears throat> Ms. Muller here. Welcome, Ms. Muller. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> I also have a PowerPoint, and Sydney's going to help me right away. Great. We won't fire up the timer until we get started here. <laughs> and since oh, yeah, that's great. Okay. So my name is Jacqueline Mueller. I live on 639 Mapleton Avenue, and also this um, presentation is co-authored by Kevin Lambert, who lives at 403 Mapleton Avenue. He was unable to be here. He's out of town tonight. So um, let's see. Hoo -hoo. Where do I go now, Cindy? Down now. I'm good? Down now. Okay. Okay, so as a resident and contributor to this community for 34 <laughs> years, I would like to address the topic of the public participation in development projects in residential areas, and I'm hoping that this topic is also of interest to you. I'd like to bring to your attention the importance of the findings and recommendations of the Public Participation Working Group. They would address, these recommendations would address the lack of citizen engagement, as well as the weariness and overwhelm many of us are experiencing in this cycle of continued development and overdevelopment here in Boulder, without really feeling like we have a place at the table. It would also have the possibility of bringing more trust in our governing and planning bodies. I am certainly longing to live in a community where I can trust that my voice matters. And I'm guessing that probably you do too. <laughs> so the specific concern that I'm bringing this evening is the impact of increased general and heavy construction truck traffic during development projects in our neighborhood. There are safety concerns with children playing, going to school, walking around, pedestrians and pets, increased risk of vehicle accidents, health concerns, dust and noise, structural impacts on our homes, increased road damage, and disruption of community and peace. So our recommendations are that the public tr participation in residential neighborhoods be included in determination of the traffic impact study parameters, such as the number and size of trucks, the truck routes that are used, and the hours of operation. So um, 
Right now, I'm curious to know how you're receiving our concerns and recommendations, and I leave you with this request. After hearing the, the PPWG recommendations on changing the culture of public engagement in Boulder, how would you implement empowered public participation in the determination of traffic impact study parameters? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Muller. Um, next up is uh, Phil Delamere, who's pooling with, and I apologize, I can't read very well, uh, Sue Publer and Sheila Pelham, and our, oh, uh, Delamere, sorry, are both of you here? Sue Dubler and Sheila Delamere. <laughs> Thank you, sorry for the bad reading here. Welcome, Mr. <laughs> Delamere. It's pulling my writing. So I was able to present to the Design Advisory Board uh, a couple weeks ago or maybe a week ago, I'm not sure exactly when that was, and it's a very similar presentation, and it was met with warm welcome. And I started out that presentation at some point all constructually net zero, and that was from a former um, city official that said that. So why net zero? Well, it turns out the energy is cheaper, which basically is a good community benefit because it lowers the energy pricing for everybody with lower peak demands. It provides a more stable energy infrastructure, such as grid stability. Currently, solar is our cheapest form of energy. It's about six cents a kilowatt hour. Battery storage today is sitting at about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So not all the electricity from solar is utilized during the day in a, in a typical household, and so basically that energy goes back onto the grid. But with a battery, what would happen is you would store that energy and then use that at night. And so in, in so doing, I've monitored all my energy in my house, and I, I've come to the conclusion that I could provide energy to my house with a, with a battery for nine months of the year. Um, I also would be offsetting for the other three months, but not fully. So Tesla, uh, off in Hawaii, they, they put together a system with solar and batteries. They're charging the utility 11 cents a kilowatt hour, and this reduces our carbon footprint. So when we build a new building, this construction is basically good for 100 plus years. And so I had the opportunity to work with uh, some builders in the past, and they had to meet some uh, standards here in Boulder, and they sort of fell short. And so they called me up and said, hey, uh, we need some solar. So I had one project that required three solar panels. The cost of that system was just astronomical. The homeowner didn't understand or I didn't communicate to that homeowner for a few thousand dollars more, you could offset about 10 times the amount of energy because there were a lot of connections that were already in place. And so basically the system just needed more panels. So upfront money, that, that's one of the reasons that builders really are reluctant to, to uh, net zero, <clears throat> which is short-term thinking and it's just to maximize their profits. They make claims like solar doesn't look good and um, boy, with the hurricane we got blowing out there, things aren't gonna be looking too good in Florida, I'll tell you that. Um, solar, they also say solar is a hassle to install. So why net zero now? It turns out in California, they are shooting for 2020. I think that's a few years before Boulder is. And that's for residential homes. Uh, total costs for uh, net zero energy homes are lower. Zero net energy homes are healthier for you and the planet. Zero net energy homes are more resilient because the, the construction, the walls are thicker. They have more insulation. They take into consideration some air exchange. So who's leading us? Is it the developers? And you know, I've, I've worked with enough developers now that um, there is feedback from the department to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, you're, you're not quite as energy efficient as we want. 
And uh, so I, I really put that upon you guys to take us forward. Uh, you guys need to take a stronger leadership role on it. And I, I personally do not see any reason why we can't move forward at a faster pace. So our city's officials, they uh, ran on a platform of practical, reasonable, sensible ideas for the citizens. <coughs> and I feel like too much focus and power has been granted to, de to developers rather than the citizens of Boulder. Again, as the prior person just said, I'm not so sure our voices are heard. <clears throat> Every citizen participation resonates affordable housing. How many meetings have you guys gone to where it's just affordable housing, affordable housing? Sort of my big beef on all this is that you guys are taking affordable housing and you're putting it on the outskirts of Boulder rather than distributing it throughout the town, which I would like to see more of. Here's a really interesting fact. 90% of people in the USA are in favor of solar. It's the highest acceptance level uh, that would be this year. Boulder citizens look to officials leading in renewable sources of energy. Where is the sustainability in Boulder? Is bulldozing a reasonable, practical, sensible, sustainable practice? No. Is net zero the way to go? Yes. One of my concerns is what's going to happen down here at Community Hospital. Um, I, I don't think that building should be totally bulldozed. So my feelings are that developers are not green enough and they definitely overbuild sites. The city of Boulder and developers are not installing enough solar today. Solar costs have dropped 45% over the last three years to below $3 a watt before tax and credit rebates. As a minimum, all new construction be designed with solar ready areas based on net zero specifications. And I know we have that in place, but I don't want a postage size three solar array panel system going on a house. That house could have held 10 or what about 30 times what was put on there. Um, On-site solar is becoming cheaper than transmission costs. Again, Excel charges 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Transmission costs are six to seven cents a kilowatt hour. And if you recall from the first slide, solar costs six cents a kilowatt hour. Developers' plans rarely meet or exceed current city energy guidelines on energy retrofit later. So the project meets the standards installing the minimum clean energy systems. Solar uh, would be their safety net. And I've got a little cartoon there where the city officials with a yellow hat saying, hey, you're, you're short green points. And the developer saying, oh, well, uh, we'll just add a couple more panels. So most site plans show all, uh, almost complete demolition of existing structures and clear cutting of all vegetation, little mature green, with lo leaving little little mature green space. Offsets are pushed to the outer limits. So our solutions are solar battery heat pumps. We've got solar tile roofs. They're faster install, cheaper, longer life, cost effective, more durable, and they have higher ratings for wind and hail. A battery in every home takes care of all nighttime power consumption requirements. It costs about $800 a year. You can finish up your thoughts. Sure, and it's dropping. Potential battery packs may have a life of up to 25 years today. I'm going to skip the part on transportation. I'll just summarize it real quick, but we need to do more. And there are going to be huge changes, and I encourage you all to, to uh, deal with that. So in summary, net zero is our future, and the rate of adoption is slowing, slowly increasing. But now is the time to make the shift to new technologies that are better, cheaper, provide a clean on-site, that provide a clean on-site energy solution. All building needs to exceed today's standards and meet tomorrow's goals of net zero. Transportation isn't properly being addressed. Get affordable housing throughout Boulder. How are your decisions benefiting the people of Boulder? Take control and lead us to net zero. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Delamere. Uh, Cindy, is anyone else signed up? Would anyone else like to address the board on issues other than our public hearing items? Um, Thank you all and uh, encourage everybody. One of the best modes of communication we have, we have two types of things come before us. One are site specific matters like we'll be seeing later this evening. Um, and we do get those packets a couple weeks in advance. And I know all of us read those carefully as well as all the emails and other submissions and highly encourage folks to make this sort of 
um, points that you made tonight and specific analyses of traffic or energy or other sort of things on those projects because we read uh, all of those messages and we appreciate that feedback and we often will use that to ask questions of staff and the developers and impose conditions which we've, we've frequently done. So uh, encourage folks to do that. We also will see revisions to our energy code and green points program and other sort of pieces. Uh, and those are opportunities for everybody to have uh, input on those as well. So um, thanks for coming out and appreciate the input and look forward to more in the future. Um, so with that, we're gonna move to the list of site-specific uh, materials um, that we've got. Um, the next item on our agenda uh, is discussion of dispositions, call-ups, and continuations, uh, of which we've got two, 2930 Pearl Street and 2032 17th Street. Um, does anybody have questions, comments, or would like to take any action related to those? Crystal? I had a question. I put it out on an email today, but I haven't had a chance to check it. But on uh, 2930 Pearl Street, Pearl Place, um, is the applicant going to be liable for, or not liable, be subject to li the linkage fees for affordable housing for phase two of that project because they're asking for an amendment to the site review plan? Yes, the linkage fee uh, is triggered by building permit application. And regardless of this request for amendment of the site review, that phase, the building permits for that phase will be subject to the linkage fee. Okay, so when city council approved the linkage fees, they waived everybody that had an application in from that requirement. Um, I think uh, there, there was an exemption, and I think the first phase, phase of the per place development fell under that. Um, and what the exemption was, it was for building permits that were filed by a certain date that were associated with a technical document review application that also had been filed by a certain date. So it was, pretty, it was set up in a complicated manner, but but every, to fall under that, I think the applications had to be filed for tech doc by September 7, 2015. So that has long passed. Okay, well thank you. Great, thank you. Other questions, comments? Um, oh, go ahead, David. I had a question on the 2032 17th Street one. Excuse me, I'm gonna have to recuse myself because I'll I received that question. notice of that project. We'll come grab you as soon as we're done. Crystal. Is the door locked? I'm locked in. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Sorry. I, this should be pretty quick, but um, there's a, um, a curb cut being removed uh, for uh, which um, should be an advantage because of an extra parking space on 17th Street. Um, but I was just wondering, there's a, the curb cup kind of leaks over into the neighboring property where there's a gated entrance. Is that, yeah, that probably doesn't affect being able to remove that curb cut. You just, that whole thing is just gonna be removed and then they'll park over on the alleyway around the corner. Is that how that's working? Yes, Elaine McLaughlin, I'm case manager on the call-up uh, this evening. The site is, L-shaped, as you probably noted, and the alley access is the access where they would be parking. And the requirement is to have parking off the lowest category street, in that case, the alley. So removal of um, the additional curb cut would be necessary. Cool, okay, great. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. I hope that, that answers it, your question. Well, it kind of overlapped, it, it overlapped into 1200 spruce, but I don't think they need it because it's just like a gated entrance, uh, a pedestrian entrance. So, Correct. So and they'll probably remove the whole curb cut, the curb cut, I would assume. That's true, and the applicant would be responsible for any kind of measures that would occur on overlapping into the adjacent property. Cool, thank you. Great, thank you, Elaine. Shall I get Crystal? Uh, that would be great, unless anyone has any other questions or comments. Seeing none, I think we can move on and we'll hold just a second. Welcome back. 
Um, so our next agenda item is uh, 5A, which is a public hearing in consideration of a site review application to restore the facade of the existing contributing building at 1911 11th Street in the downtown historic district, rebuild the third floor with additional height up to 40 feet, two and a half inches, and rooftop deck, enclosed lobby area, and replace sidewalks and streetscaping within the DT5 downtown 5 zoning district. And just as a preview of coming attractions uh, on this, um, this is a quasi-judicial matter, so we will be guided by um, the evidence that's presented to us and is in our packet. Um, we'll have a brief, actually first we're going to take um, a quick opportunity um, to ask the board whether they've had any communications outside of the four corners uh, of this record um, or whether they've read or seen things that are outside of the record. Um, then we'll turn to staff to provide a short presentation. We may have some questions of staff. Um, then the applicant will have a chance to make a presentation. We may have some questions for applicant. And then we'll turn to the public um, and seek any comments or thoughts that you have. Once that's done, we'll bring it back to the board uh, and uh, discuss it and render a decision based on uh, all of the evidence and information that's been provided. Um, to us. So with that, um, why don't we start with any disclosures that people have to make. Um, Krista, you want to kick us off? Yeah. No, I read all the information and reviewed the plans that were sent to us, as well as took a site tour. Okay. Um, I read the information and otherwise no ex parte contacts or communications. Great. Liz? It's same for me. I read the packet and uh, no site visit or any other ex parte communications. Great. And I also read the packet and all the materials. Didn't do a specific site visit, but regularly go by that building and familiar with it. Brian? Just the packet and a site visit. Peter? I've toured the property a few years ago when there was another potential buyer who was a potential client of mine. David? Uh, I, I just walked around the property on a site tour and uh, reviewed the packet and no ex parte. Terrific. Thank you. And ready to take it away? All right. All right. So good evening, everyone. Um, for tonight's discussion, I'll be presenting the site review request for 1911 9th Street. Um, so the project is required to complete a site review to allow for the requested modifications to the height and setbacks. And we should just make sure we introduce you, Shannon. Yes. Uh, so everyone knows you and uh, knows you're doing the hard work on this one. Yeah, so I'm Shannon Moeller. I'm one of the planners on staff. Um, so for the staff presentation, I'll just provide a brief overview of what was in the staff memo, including um, the existing site and surroundings, um, the site review proposal, the key issues, and, and with a recommendation to the board. Um, as part of the public process, written notice was sent and notice was posted on the property. Um, all public notice requirements uh, of the land use code have been met. Um, public comments received were included in the staff memo. Staff received one comment in opposition to the project, which included concerns regarding height modifications in general, as well as noise on the proposed roof deck. Um, so as I mentioned, the proposal is eligible for and has applied for site review to allow for modifications to the land use code. In particular, the proposal is eligible for and includes a request for a height modification, which requires this decision by planning board at a public hearing. The proposal is located in the downtown historic district and will require a landmark alteration certificate. The applicant has already met with the landmarks design review committee two times at the beginning of this year and received preliminary support for the proposal and was advised to go ahead and begin the site review process. So if this site review is approved, the applicant will then return to the review committee and obtain final approval from the committee and uh, move forward with a landmarks alteration certificate prior to starting work. And if it receives all those approvals, then they can move forward with technical documents, revocable permits, and building permits. Um, so the proposal is located at the northwest corner of Walnut and 11th Street in downtown. 
Here you can see some of the surrounding buildings. Um, you can see Pearl West to the north and west of the site, and 1050 Walnut to the south, as well as the Rio building east of the site. Um, it's located in the central area of the city, which allows for the greatest intensity and diversity of uses. The BVCP designates the area as regional business. And the uh, zoning district for the site is Downtown 5. As part of the um, Downtown 5 zoning district, the property is located within the areas where height modifications may be considered through a site review request pursuant to the recent ordinances passed by City Council related to the height modification process. And the proposal is also located in the Central Area General Improvement District. This means that since the proposal contains solely non-residential uses, parking is not required. So here we can see the proposals in the Downtown Historic District, and it's a contributing structure. Um, this requires the landmark alteration certificate we talked about, and it must meet the downtown urban design guidelines. Um, so as mentioned earlier, the applicant will be going back to the LDRC committee um, to attain that LAC approval if tonight's proposal is approved. And staff has also reviewed the proposal against the downtown urban design guidelines, which are discussed later as a key issue. So here you can see a historic photo from approximately 1935. The building was constructed between 1895 and 1900 and served as a grain, hay and grain storage building and later was used as furniture and upholstery warehouse and moving and storage facility. In 1972, the building was remodeled and a third story was inset into the second story. The remodel added many elements and art alterations that weren't in keeping with the original design of the building. And it also reduced some of the floor to ceiling heights to less than eight feet, which greatly affected the usability of some of the interior spaces. So here you can see the building today. Um, you can see the Walrus Tavern occupies the lower level and offices occupy the upper levels. And the proposal maintains these uses. Um, looking at the building a bit more, um, you can see some of the effects of the 1970s era remodel which altered the building's historic appearance, including alterations to the floor plates, which created the sunken lower level and entryway where the walrus exists. It created four stories where two previously existed, um, low ceiling heights, and it eliminated the historic storefronts on the south and east facades. Um, it created two non-historic arched openings, and it created the addition of the wooden appurtenance you can see on the south facade of the upper level. Moving to tonight's proposal, the site review um, seeks to restore many of the original elements of the building and requests a height increase to allow ceiling heights in the two upper floors to be adjusted to greatly improve the usability of the interior spaces. So here you can see um, just a comparison of the historic current and proposed facades. Um, and here is a list of the proposed restoration items, including relocating the southeast corner entry door back up to street level and removing the 1970s area wooden projection and reconstructing the historic parapet on the south facade. The proposal also includes reconstructing the historic storefronts and infilling the um, two-story arched openings on the east facade, which will allow for the creation of interior lobby and long-term bike storage spaces. <coughs> um, at the top level, the proposal requests um, the height increase for a new taller portion of the building, which will be set back 15 feet behind the existing building facade to limit its visibility from street level. The new area of the facade would include contemporary gray insulated metal panels and expanses of glass to provide differentiation from the traditional brick historic structure. And this area is intended to be visually unobtrusive rather than attempting to mimic the style and materials of the existing structure. And at the ground floor, the proposal also includes new window awnings, increased building transparency, and a new entry at the north end of the building to provide additional activation at the street level. On the site plan, you can see the proposed pedestrian-oriented amenities, um, including 
replacement sidewalks, short-term bike parking, street trees, and street furniture in compliance with the downtown urban design guidelines. Um, the existing and proposed uses of the upper floors of the building is office space. And the proposal includes an outdoor open space atop the existing structure for use as an outdoor gathering place for the office users. So moving to the key issues, staff identified the following for discussion. Does the proposal meet the relevant policies of the BBCP? And do the proposed modifications to the heightened setback um, site heightened setbacks meet the site review criteria and does the proposal meet the standards of the downtown urban design guidelines? Um, for the first key issue, staff found the proposal did meet many of the BBCP polities, in particular the items listed on this slide. Um, a complete analysis of the policies is found in the staff memo. For the second key issue, staff evaluated if the proposed modifications to heightened setbacks <coughs> were in keeping with the review criteria. Um, as mentioned, the, height, the site is eligible for a height modification. Existing buildings immediately to the north and south already exist at a 55-foot height, and this proposal seeks to increase the building from its current height of 36 feet to 40 feet, 2 and a half inches, where the maximum is 38 feet. Um, the area to be 40 feet, 2 and a half inches is set back 15 foot from the public right-of-way, and as seen in the street level perspectives on the slide, the design is generally unobtrusive and would also greatly improve the usability of the upper floors of the building. Um, the proposal includes a modification request to place a deck atop the existing roof of the building to provide that outdoor space for the office users. Under current zoning, it would need to be set back 15 feet from the street. Um, since the building is built to the property line and provides no open space currently for the office users, locating an office, a rooftop deck in this area would also improve the desirability of the office spaces. So staff found that the proposal and the requested modifications did comply with the site review criteria and are supportable. And staff's complete analysis um, are in attachment A to the memo. In the third key issue, staff evaluated the proposal against the downtown urban design guidelines, including all the sections listed on this slide. And staff found the proposal successfully distinguished the new portion of the facade from the traditional brick structure and created a differentiated and minimally perceptible contemporary alteration to the building. And it also um, will preserve and restore much of the original character and materials of the building, as well as improve the public realm. So staff found the proposal to be in compliance with the urban design guidelines, and staff's analysis is located in attachment B to the staff memo. Um, so to wrap up, staff did find the proposal to be consistent with the relevant design guidelines and review criteria, and therefore recommends the board adopt the motion listed in the memo and shown on the screen. And here again are those key issues, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Shannon. Appreciate it. Um, any questions for Shannon? Liz? I just had um, a question about the... Um, the materials when the cornice gets reconstructed and any other sort of areas where brick gets filled in, are there standards for how well the new material has to match the old material? Yes, exactly. I think that's why um, in our conditions of approval, we specifically mentioned that the proposal will need to go back to the Landmarks Design Review Committee. We really wanted them to be able to, mm -hmm. to look at those materials and make sure that they are able to provide their expertise on the exact um, brick and mortar that's going to be used. Yeah, because that, that will just make a huge difference. Yeah. The other th question I had, if you could bring up that slide that shows, that has some elevations, the east side elevations. Um, there, that one. Um, there is a cornice on the east side now, and um, in the historic photos, that cornice extended over six of the east side windows. And it looks like in the plans that the um, applicant has sent in, it's going to be not that long. It's going to extend over like five of the, um, yeah, five of the windows. I don't know if it's, uh, I'm just concerned about the drawings, if maybe they're not reflecting exactly the length of the existing cornice and 
because I, I assume that they're that staff is expecting that they're going to keep that right um, even though there's mm -hmm. going to be a fair amount of work done to that facade the cornice will yes yeah exactly that's the intent of the design and I know that um, the applicant can speak to it a little more but the intent is to keep that entire cornice so that is something we can look at again at the technical document okay. review. yeah Good. great thank you great any other yep. Harmon and then crystal <laughs> So Shannon, the, um, the staff report talked about the rooftop deck as being for office users, so I'm taking that to mean that there's no public access to the rooftop deck, is that correct? That's correct, yeah, it would be for users of the offices. Mm -hmm. Great, Crystal? I had a question on the landmarks review process. So you mentioned landmarks will be looking at bricks and mortar and materials, but normally they look at the whole building. So will they have that purview this time i mean if they mm -hmm. feel uh, or if they had an issue like liz brought up or <clears throat> some detail with the door because if as i understand your presentation it just went to the landmarks design review committee which isn't made up of the whole board so you don't have the benefit of um of the expertise of everyone from that board so if they find something that they think would work better with the building or uh, some elements of the fourth floor. Is that the, th or the third floor, is it? Mm -hmm. The top, the rooftop floor. Are they, they'll be able to comment on that then. Yeah, I think that their ability to comment on things is not, you know, hindered by this. Um, staff has definitely made an effort to work with um, our staff in historic preservation and landmarks and kind of keep an open communication during this process to make sure that um, the applicant is kind of moving through the landmarks process and this process in tandem so that hopefully they'll be moving in the right direction the whole time. Great, thank you. Any other questions? David? Um, just to add on to that, um, I'm the non-voting liaison to the Landmarks Board, so I think that um, LDRC members can call up things to the full board if they want to. I don't know if it applies to every every review, but yeah. just something, mm -hmm. something to keep in mind as well. But I did have a, um, a question about whether there might be an opportunity. There's some um, improvements going on the streetscape, and I wondered if um, there were, was any thought to whether this area might benefit from either a charging station or, or a car share space or both. Um, I don't know where the nearest one might be at this point, so I just wondered if that was looked at. Um, that wasn't something that was part of the proposal. Um, mm -hmm. I could um, turn that over to the applicant if that was something that was ever considered. But Okay. Mm -hmm. We can wait till the applicant mm -hmm. presentation. Thank you. Shannon, just one more clarification. So it is going, it is scheduled for the whole Landmarks Board? Not to my knowledge. I think that the level, the scope of this one doesn't, it, as far as I know, this one is at the Landmarks Design Review Committee level. Okay. And it could be pushed up to the full board if necessary, but I think right now it's at the committee level. Okay, thank you. Great, any other questions? Great, thank you, Shannon. Is there an applicant presentation this evening? Welcome, if you could make sure you introduce yourself to yes. the board and the audience. I'm Scott Littlefield, I'm the owner of 1911 11th Street. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you, you all on the planning board for all your time and effort in both uh, reviewing the documents and, um, and your comments so far. Could you um, lean in a little bit? Oh, sorry. That's Is that better? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm here tonight with Leonard Thomas from Urban West Studios, who's the architect who's helped me with the design on the building. Um, and I think briefly, I'm just gonna go over some of the motivations behind the redesign, um, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Leonard to go into more depth on the technical aspects of the design. Um, so briefly, the, the overall motivation of the redesign is, um, as Shannon mentioned, this is occupies a very prominent location in the downtown area. Um, but over the last few years, um, the building has started to decline. It's, um, it, it's not in the, the same shape that it really deserves to be. And um, looking at that, that kind of lack of design, 
our idea is to, to really push back and bring back the original, a lot of the elements of the original warehouse feel um, while still melding some of the, off the office elements and allowing it to be a more usable office space that also um, reflects that, that beautiful design from the early 1900s. Um, and on that note, I'm going to just shift it over to, to Leonard. He has more of the meat of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Cindy. Good evening. My name is Leonard Thomas with um, Urban West Studio. I'm at 3135 23rd Street. So just take a second. You tilt the microphone up, it may help you too. Thank you. Um, I don't have a very long presentation for you, um, but uh, I just wanted to kind of touch on a couple of the high points of what the proposals are to to really um, bring this building into the next century and beyond. And um, first, firstly, I want to thank the staff. Staff's been great working on this project. They've been very consistent. They've been very thorough. Um, good to work with, so um, thank you for their time. Um, so, so the outline of this project is really, uh, um, I just kind of wanted to go through what the, what the prime goals were, really what we're trying to do. Um, so we're not able to add any square footage, so there isn't any square, new square footage added to this building within this proposal. We're shifting it around a little bit. Um, we're, um, as Shannon mentioned, we're adding some height to the fourth floor. And I don't know if you probably should walk through the building at some point because it is r really very low in there and it's it's pretty tough. Uh, it's a it's a tough environment. And so the thought was that if we could bump up the the upper level, and we're calling it the fourth floor, uh, that we would be able to get some views uh, outside rather than just to the backside of the air conditioner units, which is what you see right now. Um, another element was to uh, enclose the lobby. Right now the lobby is uh, uh, kind of a public nuisance. People hang out there late in the evening. It isn't very safe. So that's part of the shifting of the square footage is to enclose the lobby. Um, to create a, uh, a usable roof deck, I have some images here. I'll show you of what the roof looks like right now. Um, to create a ground level retail space at the northeast corner we felt was important uh, uh, it's part of the urban design guidelines to really add more to transparency and, and activate that street um, so um, along with the site review if we're going to add for the additional height some of the things that kind of came along with that were to reconstruct the exterior more, more or less back to the original condition and you know I, th I think that all those improvements to the exterior are really going to make it a much better building long term I think that the remodel that was done um, back in the 70s was it wasn't a very wasn't a very thoughtful one and so we're trying to restore it back and we have the support of the of the landmark staff to do that and I think ultimately it's going to be a much better building um, another thing that we're going to be doing is improving the entry into the Walrus Tavern. Right now, that hasn't really been talked about that much, but right now you have to go down three steps, so we're bringing it up to grade. Um, um, so I'm just going to very quickly go through some images over here that you see on the screens. Um, this is just kind of the context, again, which Shannon covered pretty well. Um, it really is a pretty small building height-wise and area-wise uh, compared to the adjacent buildings to the north and the west and the south. And um, these are some other other views that uh, show sort of the context of it. A little brick image up there in the corner. Um, uh, I think that sort of speaks to the um, tough condition that the building is in right now. 
uh, that brick doesn't match the original brick adjacent to it. So what we're doing is we're sourcing, actually we're not sourcing, we have to refabricate that existing older brick because it's a, uh, it's not so much that the color's that hard to get, but the, the size isn't a standard size. So, so we're going to great lengths to replace the brick. Although I will say that there's four different brick types used in the building. There were uh, parts of the building fell down over the course of time. We can't replace all those, but the areas where there's new construction, um, the intention is to clean up the brickwork. Um, those arches, we're going to make those arches go away. Those are sort of poorly proportioned, and and then the um, overhang over 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 walnut. I really haven't heard anybody step up to defend that. So so we're trying to bring that back to the original Just design. <laughs> I'm sure someone will at some point, but um, again, just sort of more contextual images there. Um, and that gives a view of what the condition of that, in, not interior, but the sort of recessed lobby is right now. So that will be an, um, an enclosed, fairly formal lobby for an office, for a type A office building. Um, these are, uh, shots of the existing roofscape that we have right now, sort of in the upper left, that's the view looking to the west, and that's the view that we're trying to sort of capture. Um, the one down below that, that sort of illustrates the, the little window aperture from where the roof is to the canopy. So, and then on the, the, the right side of that, that's all the mechanical equipment. So really, when you're up at that upper level, if you're tall enough to look out the window, what you look at is sort of the backside of all those mechanical units. So really, in sort of net numbers, we're trying to raise that existing roof level up about four and a half feet or something like that above where it exists today in order to get more view. It won't really be completely above the roof plane um, because I think Landmark was concerned that too much building up there, too much visibility from the street would um, set up a conflict with the, uh, with the building below. So we are keeping it fairly low. Um, uh, I'm going to kind of wrap it up here, but um, this, is a, this is a very challenging project. I think that, that Scott really should deserve some kind of an award if there is such a thing for taking on such a challenging building and committing to restoring that exterior, uh, the hardscape out in front. Um, I mean, there, this is an enormous undertaking. Um, and and I realize that this comment's gonna be a little bit too general, really, even for the, for the, for the board to really comment on, maybe, but I, have, I sort of feel compelled to say it anyway, that really what you're, what you're seeing uh, are drawings that are schematic um, because it, it, it the, as you get into a project, you have to kind of quickly get into landmarks, then you quickly get it to, to the, uh, to, into the site review. It will evolve, and it's an existing building with all kinds of challenges. Those challenges are structural, code challenges, energy challenges, ADA challenges across the board, and so, uh, we, we're we're going to do our absolute very best to um, hit e every one of the conditions of approval. We we have to, but uh, as we go forward, if there could be a little bit of latitude, in particular with respect to pertinences, perhaps, or screening of the mechanical, or some of those elements on the on the upper level, it's just going to be a challenge to to fit all that in, and so. Um, So again, that's a little general, but I had to say it. So, um, I think that's all from my list, but I'll be here to answer any questions, but thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Littlefield. Are there questions for the board, from the board for the applicant? Liz? Yeah, um, <laughs> first, there is an award. Yeah, I know. Landmarks issues an award. And so you can stand up. I have a question also. So you may, you never know. I mean, you may qualify, especially since this block needs so much help. Um, but no, it was when you said four floors, because um, when I read the packet, it talks about 
the existing floor, um, sort of the basement level, that's going to become a crawl space. It says a crawl space is proposed on the basement level where the floor exists today. And so that's not going to be a story, right? You wouldn't count that as a... Yeah, uh, currently um, the building is four floors. Uh, then the first level is uh, about two feet below finished grade at the highest point, so it goes down from there. Um, it, it, uh, by the reading of the code, it doesn't it doesn't count as a, a basement. It counts as a as a floor. So when you add the upper levels above it, it's four floors currently, and it will be four floors in the future. The part that we're taking out is in the north uh, east corner of the building. It's basically it's a it's a dead corner of the building right right now, and and so we're um, decommissioning that square footage and adding that small amount of square footage, it's basically about a thousand square foot up to the fourth floor. Mm -hmm. And what that does is that enables us to have a street level retail or a restaurant or a cafe or something at the northeast corner by pushing that down. I so. see. Okay, thank you. And then um, The other question I had was about, are you going to pursue um, the historic preservation tax credits for, I, I, I saw in the in the memo that you had talked to staff about the possibility of that and um, the benefits are can be pretty substantial, especially for a commercial building. Yeah, I'm certain that we will, uh, whether it goes, you know, all the way to sort of the highest level of the state level or uh, we don't know that yet, but as the landmarks has been very specific about, we're not trying to generally re recreate things. We are reconstructing things that 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 qualifies us to um, mm -hmm. apply for those kinds of right assistance. And the I'm just the reason I brought it up is because you have to document the before and not just the after really well. And so if you're thinking about going that route you know, take lots and lots of pictures now of the existing, all the existing, you know, interior conditions and exterior and everything, so. No, that's a, that's a good heads up, thank you. <laughs> that's it. Any other questions? David? I'll just ask my question. Um, I don't know if you had, I don't even really know what's involved, but um, thought about putting electric charging station or, or a special space for uh, car share. Uh, since I saw you were doing all those cool things, adding new bike parking and things like that along the street and new uh, landscaping. So I don't know if that ever came up when you were talking about the, what you were going to do with the street in front, but uh, just just curious. Yeah, that item hasn't come up in particular. Basically, the scope of the public realm work is to um, replace all the street trees, yeah. replace all the hardscape, and bring it up to the current design standards, add a little bit of seating, add public um, um, short-term bike parking and long-term bike parking within the building. Um, there's some technical issues like everything with this building. It, there's We have to move some utility lines to accomplish some of the goals of the urban design guidelines. And so really when you add up all those all those elements, it's a, it's a fairly onerous package already. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Crystal? Yeah. Um, so on the, on the rooftop uh, section, and on top of that section, you have this um, long, what is it, three or four feet mechanical screening up on top of that? So is that going to be the actual size, or are you going to try to minimize it? Because it becomes such a feature on the very top of the building. I mean, I appreciate the screening tying into the material of the addition. Well, uh, uh, the discussion with, uh, with Landmarks and with the, with the planning staff was if we could relegate the rooftop mechanical to the west side of the building, it would be far less visible than on the eastern edge. And so to the extent that we're 
that we're able to do that. That's the that's the plan moving forward. Um, and if on the uh, north end of the end of the building, <clears throat> within the 15 foot setback that's down at the lower level, we're going to try to load that area up with as much of the the bigger pieces of equipment, of rooftop equipment. So, and the, you know, another point I think I should probably bring up is that this building will receive all new um, HVAC brought up to, you know, the, the current energy standards and so forth. And for a building this size and the kinds of systems that work, they're not small. So we're gonna do the best we can to, to be able to conceal those. Great, that's good news for me. That's always been, um, I, that's always been a concern is you get a nice architectural um, solution to your, to your third floor, um, you know, offices up there, but then you, then a person would put these ugly mechanical systems. So I'm glad you explained that. And when does that get determined? Does Landmarks then, maybe Shannon would know, would have the final say on that, or you're working together on it to try to minimize the mechanical? We're basically trying to get through this, this step in the, the process to get an approval, but we're moving ahead a little bit. Uh, we're gonna have mechanical layouts here very, very quickly. I wanna have those before I go back to the Landmarks board, so I know how big those units are and how high the screening is and exactly what we're dealing with, so they're not surprised, so. Good, but and so I'm glad you had the discussion about putting them on the west side or, or putting them lower on down or embedding them. Um, then the second question I had is on the Walnut Street side, are those gonna be offices? Or are you gonna try to have retail or um, something that's, uh, or or a restaurant or a coffee shop? Sure, like, um, like all sort of downtown um, buildings, the, the tenants sort of come and go. But I think at this point, the intention is that the, the Walrus Saloon will remain in the basement. Um, there's, and then there are other office tenants that are looking at the floors above that. And so how big they are, how many they are, we don't, we don't know that yet. But there, and, and there is a, a retail slash restaurant user looking at the, uh, the space that's, that's being proposed on the northeast corner, uh, the street level piece. Great. Great. Other that's questions? I have. Carmen? So you're, you're proposing to keep the walrus open during construction? Um, Required to would be probably a better way to put it. I think there, there's there's an existing lease in place okay. that's a long-term lease. So finished floor height for uh, first floor stays the same, and then the idea is to raise the ceiling heights for the first, second, the first and second floor. Actually, actually, the, the to raise the the ceiling height in the third floor and then have more of a reasonable floor on the fourth floor. The main level, we'll call it, it was, uh, the second level, um, <clears throat> th that the plan right now is to not rebuild that floor. Uh, there is just some dropped elements within the structure that we can thin up a little bit and the new mechanical system won't have as big a duct work, so it'll appear a little bit taller. But And, and another, another note is that currently the elevator only goes um, to some of the floors, and the the new proposal is to bring it down to the basement level, the street level, and all levels. So it'll be a five a five stop elevator. So originally, was the building constructed with uh, east west running joists that were pocketed in the brick walls, and then they were taken out in 1972 for the upper floors. I haven't, I haven't, no. I haven't seen those yet. I don't have the existing drawings of the building that was built originally. I only have the remodeled drawings. All right, thanks. Any other question, David? Um, I kept seeing that the walrus sign was going to be moved, but with the, it, there are going to be new signs that are these um, kind of unobtrusive banners. Do you have any idea where the, that old sign will go? 
because uh, it doesn't look like there's really a place for it in the new design. I was just curious. Um, I don't know where that's going to go yet, okay. um, but we're working on different sorts of pedestrian perpendicular signs and so forth that will be sort of developed. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, both of you. Um, now it's the time uh, when we'll hear from the public if anyone is interested in addressing the board. Cindy, we have anybody signed up yet? No. Would anyone like to address the board on this matter? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board um, for discussion and a decision. Um, Shannon, do you mind putting up the key issues again? Thank you. So I'm going to um, take a stab and say that a staff has proposed a memo to find that all of the site review requirements have been met, uh, in this case including the Boulder Valley Comp Plan um, <laughs> and the criteria for modifications and the downtown urban design guidelines. And so um, I think open it up for uh, discussion of anybody who may disagree with staff or see some things that they might want to um, either have as a basis for denial or um, for possible modifications of the conditions. Anyone? Agree with the staff memo. Okay. Is there a motion? I'll make it. Comment? <clears throat> Uh, I move that we approve site review case number LUR 2017-0021, incorporating the staff memorandum and the site review criteria checklist in the staff memorandum as findings of fact and subject to the recommended conditions of approval. I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> Crystal, seconded. Um, is there any discussion? I, so uh, the one thing that I've been concerned about is, um, and it's addressed here in condition of approval number three, um, it says technical document review application, the applicant shall apply for and receive Landmarks Design Review Committee approval so of a landmark alteration certificate. So I'm assuming that the problems that um, the applicant was talking about, or I don't want to say the problems, the unresolved issues will then be resolved through that process. Yeah, we want to make sure that that LAC is approved and then they can move forward with their final technical documents and right. move forward. Yeah. And can I make a comment? Sure. I want to commend you for taking on this project and, and, um, and, having a standard of trying to restore it to, you know, the, the previous um, historic structure, which was the storage building. And I was pretty surprised to see the, build, the windows on Walnut um, uh, reconfigured. At first I thought, uh-oh, what are they doing? But then when you look at the historic photos, I really appreciate you, try, you um, restoring the whole, the facades to that historic, um, that historic feeling. Gee, I have jet lag, <laughs> but I got it out. Any other comments on the motion, Liz? Yeah, I'm, I agree with everything Crystal just said. And I just w wanted to, I used to be on the Landmarks Board, so I really appreciate anybody making an effort to restore a building, um, especially a nice building downtown like this. And I think it'll really help Walnut, which needs a lot of help because you've got the Randolph Center and you've got, you know, people coming and going out of garages up and down <laughs> the street from this one. So having this uh, restored and ha and adding all of the interest that you're going to add and vitality on the uh, east side make a huge difference, I think. So congratulations. <laughs> Great. Any other comments? With that, I'll call the question all in favor of Harmon's motion to approve uh, the site review. Please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Congratulations and thank you. Um, so the next item we have is agenda item 5B. 
which is a public hearing and planning board action on a site review application proposing to redevelop the property at 1831 22nd Street with four attached residential units reviewed under case number LUR 2016-00044. Um, and the program will be, and thank you, Shannon, um, the, the program will be the same as we had um, before, which is we will hear um, any uh, disclosures that the board uh, needs to make. Um, we'll then have a brief staff application or a staff presentation, questions from the board, and we seem to have lost. <laughs> maybe, I think maybe we're taking a break. <laughs> a lot of quorum. So I'm going to take a three minute break um, just to accommodate. I'm, I can't We've lost break. We do have a bare quorum. Suddenly um, I crave chocolate. See about that. Yes. No so good. Why don't we take uh, a quick like three minute break and we'll be right back. Oh, back. And here they are. Are we starting again? Yeah, let's get going. Let's keep things moving. That was, what was my first bare quorum, though? Mm. Sometimes you got to do it. Yeah, we had a 4 0 vote on that. It was <laughs> so quick. Right. Yep. It. We'll get some stuff. I won't tell you which way it came out, but. Um, we'll watch the video. We'll watch the video. Um, we'll then hear from the applicant, the public, and then we'll bring it back to the board. Um, so, with that, why don't we start with disclosures? I'll start on your end, oh. uh, David. Um, I did a, uh, a site walkthrough, and I've uh, read the packet and no ex parte. Great. Thank you. Peter? Um, packet, no ex parte. I'm biked by there a lot, but haven't inspected the property. Yeah, Brian? Same, same stuff. Packet and site visit. And I'm in the same boat. Liz? <laughs> same thing, exactly. <laughs> same thing. Uh, same thing, site review, no ex parte. Read, read the information. Great. Thank you all. Elaine, I think you're taking driving on this one. That's right. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Elaine McLaughlin. I'm case manager on this application for site review. And uh, just a quick overview of where we're headed tonight. We're going to have a brief discussion of the public notification process. Um, we'll look at the existing context. Um, we'll touch briefly on the proposed project. The applicant will drill in a little bit more. And then we have some key issues for discussion um, and then followed by the staff recommendation. Uh, public notification was sent in a written form to neighbors within 600 feet of the property. A sign was posted on the property. Notification was made in the Daily Camera newspaper paper for the last two weeks. Tonight's hearing was also in the city's weekly departmental newsletter. And um, as a result, two public comments were received. Uh, the primary concerns included parking, traffic, the drainage ditch, and increased density. Elaine, can I stop you real yes. quickly on that? Were those two comments the ones that were included in the That's packet? That's correct. Okay, so nothing more recently. Nothing more. Okay, great, thanks. Yes, and then um, having said that about the public comment, we do need to note that there was a, a, a defect in the notification that was brought to the attention of the board, that the sign wasn't posted um, on the property as recently as yesterday. And given that, the code does require the board to make a finding at the beginning of the board's consideration of the item, whether the omission or defect has impaired the surrounding property owner's ability to participate in the public review process. If the board finds that it does, uh, then the item needs to be continued um, at least 10 days uh, in advance. And then if the board finds that it does not, the um, board may consider the item this evening. Um, staff notes that in light of the notification that has been provided, um, there has not been an omission or defect and it would not impair uh, the surrounding property owner's ability to uh, participate in the public review process. So with that, I'm going to move forward and then at the beginning of your consideration, you can make that determination. Can I just make one observation while, while you're on that topic? I just happened to look at this on Google Earth, which I'm now going to add to my list of ex parte communications. Uh. <laughs> um, and the sign is there mm. in Google Earth Wow! in Street View. That was a recent. Yeah. I, I mean, I was just looking and <laughs> thinking, like, well, there's a sign right there. Developers so it, bottomless pockets. You know, so it was there on whatever day this was photographed. Great. <laughs> but, the, but just to be clear, for the record, the sign was posted. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. And the applicant okay. does have some information about that as well. Okay. 
Uh, so when we take a look at the context, it's actually in a fairly rich, um, varied context in that it's walking distance to the much of the Boulder Valley Regional Center, including the 29th Street Mall, places like McGuckin, Safeway, other grocery stores. Um, and then on the other end, it's in walking distance to East Pearl, to the Martinez Park, which is just around the corner. And then it's even walking distance to Naropa. So pretty rich, varied context. Uh, then in the immediate context, the surroundings um, are a wide variety of residential, predominantly multifamily residential, uh, and they range from duplex and triplex to some of the larger apartment buildings that occur along Canyon Street. And there are a few single-family residences, as you can see from this um, photo montage that the applicant provided along 22nd Street. But essentially, a pretty eclectic mix of architectural styles and building styles. Most of um, most of the recent development has been probably 20 years or, or older. There's a newer building across the street. So the built environment's a product of both the comp plan, land use, and the zoning, as we know. Um, and both of them identify this as a higher density residential. The BVCP identifies it as high density residential where 14 DUs per acre or more are permitted. The RH2 zoning defines it as high density residential with a variety of attached res residential units or uses rather. Um, the site itself, if you take a look at the little uh, map in the corner, just going to walk through and take a look at the site, but it's roughly 8,300 square feet. It's located mid-block on 22nd between Canyon and Walnut. It's been developed as a two-story duplex uh, for some time, although it was originally built as um, the um, Kingdom Hall, the Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, you can see there's these little wing walls off to the side which had been removed. And an, a landmarks alteration certificate, um, or rather, I should say, excuse me, a demolition permit was granted through landmarks, um, finding that it had been substantially altered over time. So within it, there's um, an existing three-bedroom unit and a separate four-bedroom unit. Uh, the spur of the North Boulder Farmer's Ditch is located along the property line. You can kind of see it along that south property line. And then this is around the corner on the side. Um, adjacent to it is a two-story, or, or rather three-story um, apartment condominium uh, building. And then you can see at the rear of the property, It's a lot of the property is paved today, and then it goes off into the drainage ditch you can see off to the, in the um, far corner. So uh, the fact is that the ditch does require an 18-foot wide maintenance easement that encompasses, as you can see, well over a third of the site on the south side. So the remaining narrow area of the site, uh, the applicant's proposing to remove the existing duplex and build um, four townhome units with tuck under parking that you can see here, and then the second story, which has um, living space, and then the third story, which is essentially the bedroom space. Uh, through the site review process, the applicant's requesting a setback reduction in both the front and rear yard setbacks, where 25 feet is standard, they're proposing 17. And then on that north side, they're proposing a six-foot um, setback where 10 is standard. And you can see that, in essence, it has to be moved over to that north side of the property to make it work. Um, as is permitted through site review in the RH2 zoning district, uh, the land use code allows uh, an applicant to request a reduction in lot area per dwelling unit, and it permits up to 1,600 square feet of lot area through a site review process, although in this case, um, the applicant is proposing to reduce the lot area per dwelling unit to 2,076 square feet. And um, for those who are doing excellent calculations, that would work out to be about 20 to use per acre for this little small site. Uh, so as you can see in the perspective, the ac applicant's actually proposing um, within a by right height up to 32 feet um, or under the by right height of 35 feet. With regard to key issue number two, in consistency with the comp plan, staff picked out um, a few of these for this evening's discussion. There's more within the site review um, memo. But with regard to jobs housing, uh, while this only adds a couple more DUs to the site, it does actually help sort of <coughs> nick away at that jobs housing imbalance that we currently have. And, you know, you could argue help to offset the in-commuting. Um, the 
compact land use pattern um, really looks at doing infill redevelopment, particularly close to other services. And this, as we noted in that sweet spot right there in the center of Boulder, really does have a lot of merit in terms of infill development. And that um, there's a number of uh, transit facilities really close by. That's just a brief um, look at a, one of the transit maps, and you can see it's just very transit rich as well. Um, for sensitive infill and redevelopment, there's um, the desire to have durable, authentic materials, and in this case, the applicant is proposing to use um, a cedar siding, and uh, they can go over that a little bit. And um, along with, um, in, in terms of the enhanced design for the built environment, it speaks to context, pedestrian scale, and the public realm. And in this case, having fetestration on the front of the building it's a narrow building, but having it on the front of the building helps to create a street face for this, this project. Then with regard to key, is, key issue number two, again, for, um, for the sake of time, staff has pulled out just a couple of the more um, important review criteria, and that is um, building height, mass, scale, and orientation, as well as configuration are compatible with the existing character of the area or one from an adopted plan, which does not impact this area. But in that regard, staff notes that there's actually a number of higher density residential um, lots that are narrowly configured like this one, and some are right next door. And it makes for a rather unusual configuration and a fairly creative approach is necessary to, to deal with long, narrow lots, but it's not atypical for this area to have these long, narrow buildings. And similarly, uh, buildings of two, three, and four stories are not atypical in this area either. So in terms of context, staff finds that it's compatible. Um, another criterion speaks to projects being designed to a human scale. Um, and that goes back to that point that um, the BBCP policies look for, which is to create a street face, essentially human scale, uh, addressing the street with windows and doors and design details. So uh, there's no outsized elements on the building on the pedestrian level. It does have a contemporary approach to the design, but it also has a traditional scale and fenestration that meets this criteria. So with that, uh, staff is providing a recommendation of approval for the planning board, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Elaine. Questions for Elaine? Liz? Yeah, so um, this just occurred to me, but the um, North Boulder Farmer's Ditch becomes the Boulder Slough just a couple of blocks east of this, and there are some plans in the work, I think, for at least the eastern parts of the Boulder Slough to become more of a greenways, sort of multi-use path opportunity. I'm wondering if you know, and I know this is, I mean, because it just occurred to me, so I don't expect that you have this in front of you, but do you know the extent of the plans for using the slough as you know that <laughs> I, I don't the know the entire length of the slough. Yeah, to that um, I know that the transportation um, division and I looked at this as a possibility of a link, but there is no uh, transportation management or transportation master plan line to have that connection in this location, um, and. Again, back to sort of the configuration of the lot, it would be pretty challenging, is what we noted, um, to be able to put something in there. It's, a, it's such a narrow lot once you remove that, um, the ditch maintenance easement, that it would be pretty difficult to do any kind of um, multi-use path in that area. Mm. Okay. And then, um, so there's no living space on the ground floor. That's correct. That okay. Park under parking. Okay. That's it. Great. Other questions? Uh, Crystal, then David. Um, <clears throat> on the north side of the building, right now you can, on that shared drive aisle, people will walk through from 22nd Street over to the units um, that are off, what's it called, South Walnut? You know, the mm -hmm. complex um, 
I forget the name of it, Randy Hartman built it, but it's, it comes off Walnut Street. And when I've been over there walking the dog and I, there's a nice little cut through and people do cut through those streets. So are you gonna still be able to do that or will there be fencing put up? Well, that's a great question for the applicant. Not that I'm aware of okay. um, that shared access aisle will be retained again that's really the only way to access these particular units so um, that's a great question for the applicant great <laughs> david oh, I, and on uh, the same issue uh, who owns that shared uh, access so it's an access agreement a private, agree access, a agreement private access agreement between the okay. two of them yes so it could overlap both properties mm -hmm. okay any other questions I had just one, which would be, given that this is in a floodplain, that would have to be disclosed any potential purchasers, correct? I believe that's correct. And uh, the applicant did uh, just get issued a floodplain development permit for this area. Um, and um, Hella, do you know, do you have any more information on disclosure of floodplain for real estate purposes? I believe that's correct, though. Um, I, I know that there's a requirement in in, in the flood code um, for disclosure for rental properties. I'm not sure about purchase. Right, thank you. I think it might actually be under state law requiring purchaser notification. So, but we, we can ask applicant as well. Um, good, with that, why don't we turn to the applicant? Uh, would the applicant like to make a presentation? And if you could just make sure you introduce yourself for the record. Welcome. Hi. Do you have a presentation? Uh, I'm Stephen McHugh. I'm the owner's uh, representative for the development of this project. I was responsible for the signs. Uh, <laughs> Putting them over. I went over. There they were, like this. Um, so just so you know, we ha have confirmation that the signs went up. June. I put them up myself June 6th a year ago. And in the beginning of June, this June, they were still there because when the rental signs went up, there was concern who wants to rent the place that's going to be torn down. And as of today, this is what's left <laughs> of the sign. So it has been posted for a year. And my bad that I didn't notice it got carried away. It wasn't in the bushes. It wasn't anywhere. So I just wanted to let you know that's the sign story. And. Um, I want to thank you for um, reviewing this project. It's been a while and in the making, and um, I, I feel personally we've, we've worked really hard to make it fit and to make it um, a, a, a very positive central boulder experience so that um, people can enjoy the urban pedestrian lifestyle. Right now, in, it's a rental property. There are students and young working adults in there, and most of them don't have cars. So it's a, a, a really great space for getting around. Do you have any other questions for me? Great. Thank you, Mr. McHugh. Any questions for Mr. McHugh? Is your architect going to speak? Or? He is right. Oh, good. Yep. Okay. Here we go. You'll set me up. I'm Steve Dodd. I'm one of the architects on the project. The PowerPoint, really. Yep. And I need to switch the screen over so I'll get you going. Uh, so this is the project. I was going to go through some of our uh, design considerations, both the context and with the design of the actual building. Uh, and we have a couple of updated uh, graphics of the, of the project in this presentation. Uh, first of all, a little bit about the design team. Uh, Dodd Studio, that's me. I've been in practicing in Boulder for 25 years. Dan Rotner is not here uh, tonight. He's in France, lucky guy. Uh, 
but he was with uh, Coburn for 25 years. We have this Curtis Stevens with, with the Sunitas Group, who's also here to ask, answer any questions about the um, flood floodplain issues. And Carla Dakin is the landscape architect. So uh, we started with the overall, the big picture. Some of this is duplicating uh, what Elaine said, but uh, it's a great project for added density. Uh, very good access to bike paths and bus routes. It's easy walking distance to East Pearl, which is such a great neighborhood. Um, it's located in the center of a large RH2 zoning district. We think the unique thing about this property is the frontage along the farmer's ditch. It's, uh, it's a diamond in the rough, but it provides some additional greenery. It's got great southern exposure, and we've used uh, the frontage for, for access to all of the units. Just a quick map of the site and the major bus and bike paths that are within easy reach. The blue line is the north farmer's ditch. Another close-up just showing the RH2 zone district, which really surrounds the site and its uh, proximity to East Pearl Street. You saw these earlier, but they're hard to see in those little photographs, so I brought a little bit larger photos of this eclectic neighborhood that we're in <coughs> with quite a variety, primarily multifamily buildings and primarily two and three and four stories in height. So this is the view of the property, uh, both along the ditch to the west and uh, the street frontage just across from the ditch. Our core design objectives were to provide some additional high quality housing in the neighborhood to incorporate some cost effective sustainability measures, which include um, closed cell foam insulation, uh, low U value windows, uh, pre wire for potential 2.6 kilowatt solar systems for each unit. Uh, the flood conditions were a driving factor in the design of this project. So that's why we have no living space on the ground. We just have access on the ground floor and uh, the parking. Two of the parking garages are enclosed and the other two are carports to allow for the transmission of flood water through the project. Uh, we wanted to keep a compatible scale with the existing streetscape and really maximize the, the, the asset that we saw there, which was really the, the uh, frontage along the ditch. And we chose a clean, modern, uncluttered design aesthetic. We wanted something that was quiet and um, understated, but used warm and textured materials. We got the cedar siding, smooth stucco, powder-coated steel accents, and these uh, Anderson 100 windows. So they're all sort of upgrades from the type of building that's on the street now. Just quickly through the floor plans, uh, the blue is really how we're transmitting the floodwaters through. Uh, the yellow is kind of showing the access to the sun, water, and the, the trees along the ditch. Uh, we've tried to create a street presence. It's kind of difficult with a garage and really a stair entry, but we face the easternmost unit to the, to, the, to the street, put the entry there, and then the other three units are accessed from a sidewalk off the street along the ditch. Uh, there's an outdoor room on the west side. We have to maintain ditch access on the west side of the property. So that's what those two wheel tracks are. And then we really just try to create a bench, sort of an enclosed bench landscape area for open space. And the idea was to really have a relatively um, soft landscape edge to that farmer's ditch, which is an asset for all the units. Uh, moving up, as we move up, we have a lot of oversized windows to the south for sun and access to the views. Uh, there's a large feature window, again, with the challenges uh, facing the street, we created a large two-story feature window uh, at the stairwell, which gave us that ability to add a significant amount of fenestration to the street facade. And then as we go up, the uh, views open up and uh, we actually have flat iron views from the, from the roof level. So this is our rendering of the project showing the entry to the 
uh, easternmost unit and then the sidewalk access to the other three units. The south elevation across from the ditch, a couple of close-ups just to get a little bit of the character of the uh, pedestrian access to the, to the project. The north elevation, which is primarily the uh, utility side, but we have some oversized windows on that side as well. And the street view from the northeast. And here is a, a little photo montage of uh, before and after. So that's our quick presentation. Be happy to answer any questions. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for the applicant? Liz? Yeah, are the um, materials on the ground floor when it floods, are they sort of resistant or are they going to be destroyed or, you know, what kind of materials are they on the ground floor? Uh, Curtis Stevens with Sanitas Group, uh, site engineer. So with regards to that, this, this project will fall under the full FEMA and city flood guidelines, which means all of the ground floor level up to two feet above base flood has to be flood proof materials, no mechanical facilities. So basically that whole ground level will be concrete materials that can get wet. And then once it goes away, you're not looking at, you know, no sheet rocks allowed, any of those sort of, no carpet, none of that, so. Okay, and then um, you're not uh, proposing to do anything to the concrete channel itself though, is that right, or are you? The only work that is proposed there is right at the, it, it's concrete to 15 feet or 10 feet before 22nd Street and there's two culverts there. Mm -hmm. And then there's a dirt spot that the ditch company keeps having to dig out. And uh, the ditch company has asked us to, con to finish the concrete lining in that gap section because they're having erosion huh. and damage problems there. So that was actually, we engaged the ditch company uh, very early on this one because we knew nothing was happening without their blessing and uh that was part of the agreement as they basically said if we fix that they were happy i see okay and then the um on your documentation it should probably say north boulder farmer's ditch because the farmer's ditch is a whole different ditch up but you know it runs through mapleton so that's a completely different correct yeah yeah and this is actually officially the boulder slough at this point as well they, oh it is they're overlapped yeah. okay from a all right, thank you. Drainage. Oh, and um, is, yeah, is that the 100-year um, floodplain, the entire lot, or is in the 100-year floodplain? Yes, the entire lot is in the 100-year. I'm sure I read the map correctly. Yes, yeah. No, it's Great, thank you. Crystal? Yeah, could you talk a little bit about the roof, top deck, the access that's being proposed for it? And are you going to have any stair covering as it comes out on the roof? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good little trick. I'm actually tr testing it out on a custom house at the moment. So it's a it's a skylight that slides open. So the stair actually walks right up through this skylight that opens. And we're doing that because of the because of the height limit. Right, right. So it's um, it's a little bit of a trick, but we've ha we have a project at uh, 18 uh, 1828 Pearl right now that has roof decks on it, and it's proved to be a really great. It's under construction right now, across from uh, Boxcar. And that's got roof decks on it. It's proved to be just a wonderful asset to the properties, to just 360 degree views. So we think we'll have a similar opportunity here to take advantage of. And then one of the uh, letters, I'm sure you saw it, to the planning department about this, talked about noise from the rooftops. So these are gonna be townhouses? Yes. Are they gonna be sold? You know what? Yes, is that the intent? Yes. I mean, not, you never know who's, people that buy them can be noisy too. Yeah. People that rent them can be noisy. But it, it does become an issue in the, um, in the RH2 zones, in the higher density residential zones. That's why I asked that. Yep, yep. I had one quick follow-up question about the rooftop access um, through that movable skylight. Are there railings up kind of projecting and how does that work? Yeah, it's a little tricky. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to do it, but in this case, we that that's it's it's kind of like a truncated penthouse. So that penthouse comes up three feet above the deck level. 
So three feet is what we need for the handrail. So the, actually the skylight slides over the handrail and the whole thing. So we meet code compliance. I have another one that's more difficult and complicated. And There's ways around that as well. Excuse me. And that's your, at what height is the handrail then? Three feet. It's roughly three feet. And then on top of the 32 feet, so you're at 35 No, feet. 32 is, the whole thing is where is we top out. Yep. Oh. That includes the hand. So basically we have a three-foot handrail mm -hmm. on top of the roof deck, and we come up within that, within that height. Great. I'll go by um, <laughs> 1828 tomorrow. Yeah. It'd be great to look Don't. You can't go on. <laughs> Don't go on site. It's well, under construction. I, I won't. I can. I've been to a I've house. I've got my binoculars. I've been up. I've been to a house in San Francisco by Coit Tower that had one of those. It's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Since we're dwelling on the skylight, uh, yeah. what's the manufacturer? Yeah. I'm just curious. You know, the one I'm doing uh, over on Deer Valley right now is uh, Rollomatic, which is a big custom company in San Francisco. The product that we're looking at for this project is actually from the East Coast. I, uh, I think the name is on the detail drawings. It escapes me at the moment, but it's a, it's a manufactured product. Great. David? Um, yeah, we had a presentation on net zero from Phil Delamere earlier tonight, so I'll just go and ask a question that he brought up. Um, I've been on the planning board for about three or four months now, and every time I've seen a new construction project, I always see pre-wired for solar, which is great, but I've never seen actual solar panels put on. Is there like a driver why you leave it to the owners to make that decision or the renters, uh, or is any comment you have that I just am curious about what drives but wiring, but not necessarily putting the panels on. Well, you know, it's interesting. We haven't done a, a multifamily project under the new energy regs that were just adopted. Mm -hmm. I know on the residential end, I've got a couple of single family homes that have come through, and the larger single family homes are all net zero now. That's just a requirement. And I don't know how far that's gone in the, in the d direction with multifamily, just because we haven't gone through there yet. But we'll have to do that as part of the permits in the middle. Okay. Yeah. I mean, our intent is to put money into the envelope to make that as efficient as we can. And then you know, I'd rather put that money in. The city, I think, would rather us put that money into the envelope because the panels can be added later. Added on, sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't really fix the envelope after the fact. Thank you. Bless you. Any other questions? Um, just one more. Go ahead. So uh, right now people walk along that little shared um, drive access from 22nd over into the other projects. Right, but and there's we're, there's no fencing no or fencing. any obstruction to the existing condition there. Okay. Yep. Right. Yeah. It's not going anywhere. Any other questions? Hearing none, thank you both very much. Um, Cindy, has anyone signed up to speak to the board? No. Would anybody from the public like to address the board on this project? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for discussion and decision. Elaine, do you have the critical questions? I'll go through the same exercise. I do. Um, I think you need to have an action first oh, you're on right. the um, notification error. Um, as Elaine pointed out and um, Hella sent a message about, we do need to make a finding before we proceed with our discussion um, regarding whether um, the notice was adequate, and I, I assume that should take the form of a motion? Yes. So we have that on the record. Would anyone like to make a motion? I'll, I'll make a motion. Okay. I'd like to move that um, since the notice was uh, posted uh, and um, uh, the proper notification procedures were followed um, that we go ahead and um, allow for this defect uh, and go forward with the uh, completing the site review tonight. Yeah, I'll second that. Is that a good wording for that motion? Or you can, you can Hella may jump in with some suggestions here. Yeah, I would, I would add to that that you find um, that any omission or defect did not impair the surrounding, uh, surrounding property owner's ability to participate in the public review process. Would you that, accept that, as that is what I would <laughs> exactly want to say. <laughs> and I'll say exactly what you meant. I was hoping somebody would help. Uh, any discussion on David's motion? I'll second Well, I just have a general comment. I mean, I'm going to vote for, for that motion. 
but we've talked about it only addresses property owners. It doesn't address renters, our notification policy, and we've talked about this for several years. And at some point, I'd like the board to set aside some time so we can maybe get that ordinance amended if it is in the ordinance or whatever the criteria is that that it would go to property owners also because um renters also you mean excuse me i mean i'm sorry renters as well as property owners because i think that's the spirit mm -hmm. of the notification but in actuality it doesn't happen in, in my recollection, we've actually put that on our work plan, our letter to council, yeah. mm -hmm. and council has not accepted our invitation to put that on the work plan <laughs> so as of yet, I, but I think we ought to put it back on. Yeah, yeah I think if we initiate Especially with it. our public engagement efforts and stuff. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on the motion? With that, um, all in favor of David's motion to uh, continue to hear this and um, Basically, excuse the defect in notice. Please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Cindy? Um, I missed who seconded that. Uh, it was Brian. Thank you. Um, terrific. So this brings us back to um, the main event, which is the site review here. And I think similarly with the last matter, I um, want to just uh, observe that the um, packet contained a recommendation and information behind that that Elaine and others put together um, indicating that uh, they believe that it found or uh, they found that it met the BVCP policies, the site review criteria um, and particularly the um, criteria for um, a reduction in the minimum lot per dwelling and setbacks. Um, so does anybody have a different view on that? Any conditions that they'd like to discuss or a motion? I'll make a motion. Okay, go ahead. I'll even get close to the microphone so that Cindy can hear it later on. Better yet. <clears throat> I move we approve site review case LUR 2016-00044, incorporating the uh, staff memorandum and attached site review criteria checklist as findings of fact and subject to the conditions of approval recommended in the staff memorandum. Is there a second? I'll say. We collided. Don't everybody think, rush to, to second. I think David started. <laughs> so, okay, that was moved by Brian, seconded by David. Is there discussion, uh, amendments, or anything else? Do you want I, to speak to it? I, no, I, I said I don't mean. Okay, I don't, need, don't need to. Discussion. Crystal, I just want to make a few comments. First of all, Mr. Dowd, you gave a nice, straightforward presentation. Mm -hmm. I totally appreciated that. And the second thing is, is. Uh, our city has a number of RH2 zones, and I just want to let my fellow board members know, because I'm voting for this one, it's not a precedent. I would look at other projects in other of our RH2 zones in the context that they're in. So Goss Grove in Whittier on Pine Street up on the hill, because they have um, historic structures that are intact where this might not, this solution might not be as appropriate. Any other comments? I have a comment. Um, and this is also sort of a question for Elaine. Do you know if Landmarks is requiring uh, HABs documentation on this building before demolition? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, Maybe we, I wonder if we could require that just because, you know, with its religious affiliation and everything, it might be nice to have that. Um, so, you know, an archival quality sort of photographic record of what was there prior to the demolition. Um, and uh, so I might make a motion. I'm going to support the motion, but I might make a friendly amendment that we require that. I don't think it's a huge thing to require. You want, you you want to just do that now? You could just ask the applicant, too. They, they may be aware of what the requirement is. May have been part of the demolition permit they, they would process. Know. Yeah. yeah. It, want to oh, address? Okay. Would one of you like to come in? A, if you'd actually come up and make sure it's on the mic and the home audience can hear. It is required uh, for buildings old, older than 50 years to go through that process. Okay. But we're, we're not aware of any historical 
significance and went through that at the mm -hmm. li Carnegie Library mm -hmm. and, and so on. But right. the documentation you're su suggesting makes some sense. So are they, was that a requirement of your demolition permit to get? We, we don't have one, but I do know we will have to go get historic sign off okay. for the demo. But the research, up, so due diligence, uh, it's the, it is not designated mm -hmm. historic. Right, and when they do when they do that kind of survey, they don't usually do an interior documentation, no. and that's what this this would in, entail in some interior photos and uh -huh. like that too. So, but um, I think the interior is qu quite different now than yeah. it's ever been. You know, I I don't know how far they would go with it, but sure. it would be you know once it's gone, it's gone, and you can't go back. So, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's a huge additional no. effort to just photograph it. But it's it not. needs to be somebody who has there was it some experience doing this kind of archival yeah. pho photography, so. Understood. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious. Excuse me, may I, may I clarify yeah. one point? A, a um, demo permit was actually um, issued in July 2016, so maybe it didn't come to you, but maybe it came to you. Well, they expire. Um, it's probably expired by now, unless if it hasn't been renewed, because I think they're only uh, like what three months or three six months, months or something mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, we'll, we will need a new one. Okay. Great, thank you. But, um, Liz, thank you for pointing that out because there were little churches all around that area, of the downtown and the neighborhood. There's still one at. Well, one might have gotten converted right at, I believe it's 18th, whatever the street is, by the old September school. And then where Full Cycle Bikes right. is, the back part of that lot was the little uh, Second Baptist Church also that was torn down when that building was put up. Great. Just Liz, so you know, we don't. Yeah, I do. I just want to make sure that I'm not um, using the wrong words or whatever. Well, I, if I may, I was going to. Uh, I was going to suggest, Liz, maybe it should be a motion to um, Landmarks Board for their review, since it's going to come in front of them again. Yeah. As opposed to a condition of their approval, just because I think that might be easier. Okay. Process, and then they can judge exactly what the right language and requirements are. Okay. I, I, is that a good condition, or is that a uh, a separate motion? And I, I, I think I think where Brian is going is, is probably the right way to go. I don't think you have the review authority to require documenting the con, you know, what the condition of the property is and in any particular way for the future that's not related to your review. Department, Liz, I, you know I could take a crack at, at a motion that might. Fit the bill, and I sure. would say, should we just finish this prior first? Or if, is it a separate motion or an amendment? It would be a friendly amendment. Type. I can make one. Um, that we just uh, add a condition that says, prior to application for a demolition permit, the applicant shall um, submit to Landmarks Board for review, um, and uh, specifically to determine what, if any. Um, documentation of the structure is required before demolition. You accept um, those are friendly? Elaine, do we have a condition in the approval already for historic? I mean, do we need to? It, the, it's, it would be subject to it um, as a matter of, uh, of course, just because of the age of the structure. Not as a condition, just as part of the It, the it would be required, correct. Okay, so I was scrolling as fast yeah. as I could get down there, but I didn't get there at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, you can you can say you don't want the, the friendly if you think it's going to be handled through the, the normal code yeah, I can compliance look process. If, if you think that's the proper path. Yeah, I, I recommend in, imposing it as a condition of approval. I think it's outside of your purview. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'll um, deny that. Fine with me. Won't accept it. <laughs> the other thing that I had, should I go on? It was go just ahead. a comment um, that I hope then can get in the minutes and on the record, and that is that I hope that we can, and maybe this is part of the transportation master plan or something, but come up with a uh, a long-range plan for the Boulder Slough and whether that's going to be, um, you know, from one end to the other, a greenway or <laughs> transportation corridor or something like that. Because, um, you know, if you want to get to the Boulder Creek path, you have to cross Canyon and which I tried to do yesterday 
um, on my bike, doing all of these site visits at the same time. And uh, I <laughs> barely, <laughs> I have a story, but anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, but I, I, it just would be really great to have yet another um, connection and on the other side of Canyon that um, went east-west and was part of the Greenway like that. So, but I'm not going to offer a condition or anything like that. That wouldn't make sense. So, great. Any other comments, David? I'll just say that's a great idea. Looking at the map, I mean. Uh, 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 a path in that direction heading off towards, you know, the uh, Hazel's REI right. area. And Google. To, and and uh, yeah, Google. Uh, it, it's, it really is something that would be a huge mm -hmm. uh, improvement in our uh, bike, bike routes. So, yeah. yeah. Brian, I think you were going to jump in. Yeah, I was just going to comment on the design. I think you know, it's really great to see a project like this come through with a really clear approach to the flood, floodway issues that you face. Um, and I really like the design. I think it's really um, nicely simple, and I love there's only a few materials and a very simple color palette. You know, we're not falling all over ourselves to try to make, make it look like either a historic house stuck on the front of a box or um, like a bunch of little cottages stuck together uh, that might make it sort of like a zebra that you can't see in the grass. It's just a perfectly nice, clean, good, uh, well-designed building, so nice job. Also, and go ahead, Harmon. Follow up with that, um, an additional architectural comment. I think that the... Um, the scale of the buildings um, for the neighborhood and for the price point and, and what people expect um, buying a new house in that neighborhood, uh, you seem to have really hit the money on, on all of that. Um, and it, it, they look like uh, good places to live. And, uh, and I just applaud you for that. And I'll just add on the another um, kudo, which I think, um, you know, having two off off street parking spaces for each of these units will really help the neighborhood not have spillover into their onto their streets. And it's a great use of, um, you know, being in the floodplain, <clears throat> you know, using that space under the building is 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 nice. And I'll just add um, a couple of additional thoughts. Also appreciated the design. Um, I worried a little bit when I first opened the packet and saw it was a kind of a linear design on a narrow lot and having seen um, things go awry in Denver, Denver the Denver slot house uh, concept, um, you avoided that in this context, I think, with the ditch, with the shared um, driveway behind it. Um, but I think as we look at staff and the board in the future, we have to be careful to um, not commit some of the same sins that I think are occurring in Denver. You avoided that and really do appreciate that. And then I also want to say thanks for working hard to figure out a roof deck solution, which I do think is an incredible amenity um, and um, will be increasingly important to make use of that roof space in a kind of human sort of way rather than wasting it. And I think the residents will appreciate it. I think it'll be a huge amenity and treasure for these folks um, there agree with um, Crystal, we have to watch out in some context where um, there could be noise issues, but I think given the private ownership and size and that sort of thing, it's unlikely to be an issue here. So any other comments? Seeing none, I'll call the question on um, this all in favor of Brian's uh, motion um, to approve the site review. Please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Congratulations. The front parapet wall. And then uh, it's yeah, eight o'clock. Would people like to take a quick five-minute break before we That's move to the last uh, concept review? Terrific. Yes. yes. So we'll take a five to seven-minute break. The parapet wall. Thank you. Full deck. Yeah. The railing is Take care. Yeah. You too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I see ya.
released from the hospital last year. May not be passed. Yes, yeah, unless it's passed. Does that make a process? That's true. Unless you're away. Sure it's sweet or So it's ready to be. Get this guy to sleep. And she saw me at the last minute. We just looked at each other like, here's the house. It was so scary. And then I had enough adrenaline for one. Yeah. Of course. Because you think, oh, I have to prove it. I hope it's good. Yeah. No, I, I think that area has a real sense. I know, I love it.
You say that now. <laughs> Couldn't be any easier. <laughs> Those were nice. Those were, you know, <laughs> that 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 wet. In Space Mountain Parks is Ready? Okay. I'd like to call the planning board uh, hearing back to order, and we're moving on to agenda item 5C, which is a concept plan and review for redevelopment of the site at 5505 Central including existing office building on the property addressed at 5505. I think it should be replacing the existing office building Cindy. on the property um, addressed at 5505 Central with a new office building that meets form bulk and density standards of the Industrial General Zoning District. Um, so with that, we'll start as we usually do with disclosures from the board. I think this time I'll start with Crystal. Um, okay. Any disclosures you need to make? No ex parte. I went by the site and I read all the material. Same exact uh, disclosure, no ex parte communications or research of any kind, and I read the material. Great. Same, Liz? plus my near-death experience. <laughs> <laughs> More about that later. Um, and I'm the same without the near-death experience. <laughs> same as John. Same as Brian. Same as everyone else without near-death experiences. <laughs> pretty nice. Terrific. So, Elaine, I think you're back in the driver's seat on this one as well. And take it away. 
Thanks very much, Elaine McLaughlin. I'm case manager on the concept plan. And a quick overview of where we're headed. Uh, pretty typically, it's we're gonna take a look at the process um, and the context. We'll have a brief discussion of the proposed project. This one's a little bit unusual, and we'll go over that. And then uh, a couple of key issues, primarily because it's concept plan, looking at uh, BVCP policies, both uh, 2010 with touching on some in, for the new 2015. Uh, so again, the process is concept plan, and just to uh, make sure we're all on the same page here, there's no formal action that's going to be taken this evening. Um, and the intent is to take a look at uh, land uses, or the arrangement of the uses on the site, circulation patterns, um, means of encouraging alternative transportation, what the architectural characteristics are, and then environmental preservation. So starting from the broad context, um, because not a whole lot of our projects are on the east side, although some of them are starting to be, but this one's on the east side of Boulder, near the intersection of Arapaho and 55th in an area that's been identified as a neighborhood center. And there's reasons for that. In this particular case, the site is located within the Flatiron Industrial Business Park, and it's a portion of that Flatiron Industrial Business Park, and we'll talk a little bit about why. Um, it's being reviewed as a concept plan when it's essentially a built-out area. Uh, but in this particular context, it's helpful to note that there's a really broad um, varied horizontal mix of uses in this area. And you can see uh, within walking distance, there's everything from Boulder Community Hospital on one end, Boulder Jewish Commons on the other, and in between is a variety of residential from single family to the attached, including East Point Apartments, which was recently approved. There's retail nearby, um, a lot of what's becoming pretty good restaurants in that area, as well the, the municipal golf course, um, so a wide variety of uses in this context. And uh, when we drill down a little bit closer to the site, it's um, pretty evident it's all about industrial uses. And the comp plan designates it as light industrial. The zoning in this case is industrial general. And the distinction between that and the um, industrial manufacturing, which is located across 55th, is that um, while both of them permit research and manufacturing, uh, the IG has a little bit higher FAR the, than the IM, which is a 0.4 versus a 0.5. So in IG, you can do 0.5 FAR. And um, that essentially just illustrates the fact that they're very similar between the two. Uh, we tend to have larger sites with industrial manufacturing, however. Uh, so the context here, as, as highlighted, is um, several lots that were recently purchased by the same property owner and therefore because of contiguous um, mutually owned lots, it has to go through a um, concept plan and site review. It's mandatory and it's based on um, essentially the size of the property. In this case, it's about 27 acres that are mutually contiguously owned. And um, then drilling down into the specific area that's in blue that you can see lightly there, there's four lots that the applicant's proposing some improvements to and one lot in particular that's going to have a new building on it. Um, in essence, when you look at the lots that are um, owned <coughs> contiguously, um, it's in essence a suburban office park as was established essentially in the 1960s with Flatiron uh, Industrial Business Park and built out over the 70s through um, up as recently as 2000s. And then the lower right, you'll see a new building addition that was added um, as part of this ownership. It's number four in that group of four that we're gonna take a look at. Um, so wide variety of architectural styles and sizes of buildings, but a lot of parking um, and um, kind of classic suburban office park. Um, on the right, you'll see the uh, flood um, constraints, which are primarily located along uh, the ditch. It's the Dry Creek Ditch Number Two, and uh, consistent with that are uh, regulatory wetlands. Again, they tend to be configured within the ditch right away there, but it bisects these 27 acres, as you can see, and that 
throughout time this has been intentionally preserved and um, there's amenities such as walk, walking paths that uh, cross it adjacent to, in this case, adjacent to Central Avenue. But there may be opportunities to do additional um, walkways or multi-use paths along this area of the ditch, and that's something we can talk about in concept plan. So with regard to the existing context of the 5505, where the new building's going to be, um, it was built in the 70s, the late 70s, and sort of built into an earthen berm, which I think was kind of trendy back then. And um, it has about 10,000, a little less than 10,000 square feet of floor area. Um, and you can kind of get a sense of how it's built into the earth berm, but it has parking adjacent to it. Uh, in this particular case, the applicant is proposing to build that new building on the corner and then do some improvements to um, some of the circulation patterns that are within the site. And um, in doing so, the applicant will be utilizing a little bit more of the FAR, up to a 0.5 FAR is available. Currently, it's about a 0.36 FAR, and they're going up to about 0.44 FAR. Um, and you can see it's on that 5505 central lot. It'll be about a 50,000 square foot building. So with regard to connectivity, this helps to illustrate the fact that it's all sort of insular contained within each individual lot little bit of shared um, access between them, uh, but pretty much just, you know, the circle um, surrounding the building. Uh, in this case, they would like to add some connectivity between some of those sites, um, mostly vehicular. Um, and in doing so, one of the things staff had brought up in the comments is that maybe there would be opportunities for shared access in these um, locations such as this um, on the lower right, as well as maybe looking at better opportunities for pedestrian circulation, which maybe the applicant could talk about um, as we entertain some of these um, concept plan ideas. So the proposed building, um, as you can see, there's the earthen berm there. The applicant would utilize some of that existing grade and construct a new two-story building at the corner of 55th and Central. Uh, the building, you can get a sense of it um, on how it steps down, essentially two and a half stories on the east and north side. You get a sense of the uh, little topographic change that's there. With regard to key issue number one in the comp plan policies, we look to things uh, that deal with revitalizing commercial and industrial areas as a means for economic sustainability. And in this case, it also addresses <laughs> compact development patterns because this would be an infill development. We're not going outside of the areas that are um, currently not built on in the city. Um, it's, the city is also a regional job center, as we know, so this helps to support um, both uh, local businesses being able to retain businesses. Uh, another policy that is something that we should talk about is managing parking supply, which is what partially what the applicant wants to do in this circumstance. Um, and what we could also talk about that has come up in the new 2015 comp plan is that um, there sh we should look to opportunities for the sump principles, the shared, unbundled, managed, and paid parking. And in this case, certainly they're looking at shared parking. Um, whether or not the applicant would entertain unbundled, I don't know, but managed parking certainly. And paid parking, it may be something we could look at. Um, there are a lot of bus, um, there's a lot of bus access to this area, and we can talk about that a little later. Additional policies to look at, um, improved mobility grid, and again, that's something that we should look at, not just site specifically to these four lots, but take a look at some of, um, some of the ideas on a broader level for the Flatiron Industrial Business Park. How can we create better connectivity? Similarly, doing sensitive infill and redevelopment um, and then specifically, um, if we take a look at potential future redevelopment and the fact that this now is secured by a set property owner and these improvements need to be done, that maybe we could look a little more broadly through the 27 acres um, and see if we can break up some of that super block and create better connectivity throughout the site. Because as it is today, like I mentioned, it's sort of isolated among these little circles around buildings. So broadly looking at it in the future, 
for when redevelopment occurs of connecting some of these parcels. Uh, another opportunity that came up through the 2015 comp plan are opportunities to potentially infill with some residential. And this is something that um, other areas throughout the country are doing with the suburban office parks that tend to be fairly low density, large parking lots. If we think about the sump principles and being able to share, unbundle, manage, and pay parking, we have greater opportunity to do infill um, and potentially save on some of these broad areas of surface parking lots that are found throughout uh, Flatiron Industrial Park. Um, and then I'll just end with this slide that helps to kind of coalesce the idea that there is actually uh, a there there, meaning that there is this neighborhood center to 55th and Arapaho, and that actually the bus service is amazing. We, we, when we're in town here, we're in the center, we think of it as being way out there, but actually the most bus service along Arapaho on the jump will take you from this spot to downtown in 12 minutes. So in fact, there's great opportunity to uh, utilize the amenities that are there to do some creative things within this area. And with that, I'll answer any questions. Great, thank you, Elaine. Questions for Elaine? Crystal? Yeah, when Department? are we going to see the new uh, transportation demand management uh, requirements? Based on that 2015 um, comp plan, is that what you're? Well, asking? just based on a conversation. I mean, I've been on planning board for four years, and we've talked about it. But I, but it's not a planning project, so mm -hmm. maybe you can ask transportation, get back to us. Yep. Thank you. We can make a note of it. Yep. Harmon? Yeah, just a small one, but um, do you know if the FF6 bus will actually pick up along that route near the subject site or if it'll only drop off? I actually don't know that. I was looking particularly at the jump and the 206. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, note that the regional buses don't stop at local stops most of the time. Mm -hmm. Other and, questions? Oh, I have one more question. Could you put, put up the um, map showing the 100-year and 500-year floodplains? Sure. And just go over the key to the colors. I think I know what they yes. all are, but... So the um, conveyance zone is held, and it's sort of a peach color, and it's held right along the blue or purple, which is the high hazard. So most of that's contained within the ditch area. And then the lighter pinkish purple is the 100 year, mm -hmm. and then the 500 year is in gold. Great, thank you. Liz? Yeah, um, I had a question about the um, averaging the floor area. So were these four lots chosen, is it, was it arbitrary? I mean, I'm sure it wasn't arbitrary, but but could it have been arbitrary that whatever uh, lots under common ownership could have been combined to come up with this um, averaging for FAR? Well, I suppose, in fact, theoretically, they could have combined all 27 acres to come up with an average. But my understanding, you could ask the applicant this, but my understanding is they, they really wanted to be able to redevelop that corner property. And because it's all under the same ownership, they have this opportunity to create a lot of shared access and um, amenity and parking. So in fact, it makes sense that they would do it that way. I would defer to the applicant though. Okay, but um, there's nothing um, in our code that would prevent them from saying picking out um, parcel number two and using its FAR with um, parcels in your diagram there four, five, seven, and eight. Is there a no, I, I do think it has to be contiguous in order to be able to utilize that floor area. Hella, you might have some thoughts. Well, the, in, the entire area would have to be in the site review to make that work. But I think they, they could do that. I'm, I don't know that we've ever had a project where we looked at it kind of property specific. Um, but I don't see why you couldn't do that. You would kind of tie those lots more together than otherwise because 
when you sell a property, mm -hmm. you have that tie where you may not have the full development potential that you would otherwise have. So there's no requirement that they have to aggregate them for um, this FAR averaging. I mean, they, they can just pick which parcels they want to put together for this FAR averaging, and it's not... Uh, well, I don't think they're planning to do any improvements on the uh, one, two, and three lots at this point. So um, unless they wanted to do some improvements on them, I don't think you could utilize that land area to create a FAR averaging. I see. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what the rules were about it. And then um, on that, the buildings themselves count. <laughs> but if, it, if they were doing residential, like I'm thinking of the 1440 Pine, if they were doing residential and they wanted to come up with a, an allowable FAR, it would be, the approach would be as though those buildings didn't even exist. I mean, well, I mean, that in that example, which I'm not super familiar with, so um, I would say that the idea would be to cluster development. So you take all that development potential and you move it over to one side. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the intent here mm -hmm. um, as much as be able to uh, utilize the land area more efficiently with a building and more efficient parking utilization and cross access. I think, mm -hmm. I think that's specific to that zone. Um, the this zones that are controlled by floor area ratio don't mm, discriminate yeah. between residential and uh, commercial floor area. It's all the same. Uh, point. So they wouldn't be able to do the... No, it's a, it's a different Okay, uh, different that's zone good treatment. to know. And then... Um, we don't... I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm not positive. But we don't have sort of levels of impervious area maximum or maxima depending on whether they're in a 100-year floodplain or not in a 100-year floodplain. It's all the same. I believe that's correct, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, that's all. those are my questions, thanks. Any other questions for Lane? Seeing none, oh, well, go ahead. Um, you provided a, a link to a really cool transportation master plan map of all the planned and existing bike routes. Uh, and it shows uh, a pl uh, planned bike lanes along Central and then the connections over to the multi-use path and also this uh, potential multi-use uh, path going along the ditch. Um, are those all th things that we can just kind of think about whether there's an opportunity to ask for those, you know, now as part of that or... Um, so, as a point of clarification, yeah. this is not actually transportation master plan. This isn't, um, but... No, I'm correct. There is actually a link that is, it, it's not super le 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 legible here, but it's the purple dash line that goes along Central is actually from the transportation master plan. Okay. But... Um, the opportunity to do a multi-use path along the ditch, I believe, is part of um, site review criteria. In other words, we could ask for something like that. Okay. But um, again, this is really thinking off, sort of um, without the blinders on. How? What would be the ultimate uh, thing to do for connectivity for this area? And it would be to break down the super blocks a little bit better, both through vehicular access as well as pedestrian, yep. but not necessarily related to the uh, transportation master plan. Okay, thank you. Great, why don't we uh, turn to the applicant. Thanks for joining us. I'm super excited now because you guys are talking about things that, um, I'd like to touch on besides this building. So I'm Kelly Davis with Oz, 2455 10th Street. It's my home address. Um, before I start, so Liz, I think a couple of things that, um, that you were questioning that I think factor into the bigger picture. So Flatiron Park, you guys have been out there, I hope, um, have gone through it. It's, it's ready for its next generation. Um, Crescent, our client, hi Ben, I think he's watching at home tonight, is, uh, uh, have been really excited about what they see as the potential for this park to reposition it in the changing climate that we have now with the types of companies that are in Boulder, 
wanting to move out of downtown but not um, leave Boulder. And so we've been working for almost six years now with Crescent in the park, revitalizing buildings, um, repurposing buildings for tenants, uh, adding amenities like Upslope Brewery and uh, Ozo Coffee, um, as well as now starting to evolve into more structural changes to some of the physical environment. Um, if you've been to the site, you see immediately to the east, 5541, where Penton Media and Sovereign are today. That new addition to that repurposed old warehouse, the first uh, uh, renewable cross-laminated timber uh, structure in Boulder, um, one of the first ones in, uh, in a wide area, I think. But um, we're pretty excited about that. We think it starts to change the tone architecturally for that park from some of the tired old buildings that um, Elaine was showing you. So this particular project is kind of the next evolution of that in our thinking. But simultaneously with this is an ongoing sort of strategic master plan for the park. Crescent owns about 50% of the park today. Um, they may own more in the future. That includes buildings along the east facing the, the ditch and the open space. It includes these clusters of buildings. Um, so right now we're working on them inter incrementally, but we also have this master plan effort going on strategically that are really trying to address a lot of these big issues that Elaine was bringing up. How do we create more inter property um, communication, vehicularly, pedestrian, bikes, how do we tie into the TOD, what are opportunities for residential and where might that occur, and what's the bigger conversation that we need to have with planning and, and, um, and you guys about um, if we want residential, are there trade-offs? Is there, you know, how does it play into height? How does it play into the FAR that's limiting uh, the, the sites today under the current IG zoning? Is there a rezoning effort? Is there a way to, to, to start to do use reviews that encourage more of that diversity, uh, density, and that eclectic mix that I think everybody's looking for? That's kind of a bigger picture. So Liz, in answer to your question, is our understanding that in order for you to aggregate the FARs allowable, the sites that you're considering have to be contiguous. They have to touch each other. So we started with the first four sites um, under the rules of the game. All the other sites that are also contiguous have to be included in the site review proposal, even though we haven't really started looking at those sites or what their potential might be. So we're focused on the four sites here. We've aggregated those, the existing FAR, the allowable FAR, what's available to us, and concentrated um, a portion of that into the redevelopment of 5505. So that's what you see here. Um, this is gonna confuse you a little bit, but this orients west up, so you can see 55th across the top, and you can see the site. Elaine did a great job of introducing this, so I don't need to belabor it, but I think the, the key part is that berm, that transition from 55th down, almost a full story until you get to the properties to the east. So there you can see 5541 on the right, that's that new uh, building. As a part of that, we did some uh, landscape improvements as well as uh, aggregating some of the parking with the additional, uh, with the uh, adjacent sites. We're taking that a step further now with this proposed plan that she went through, increasing the, um, uh, trying to improve the circulation. One thing, I don't know if I got a mouse, yeah I do, all right. So we are closing one curb cut right here um, that provided access to the old building, focusing all the, uh, uh, vehicular traffic here a little further from this intersection, which is also uh, an enhancement to, to some of the safety of the, the uh, pedestrian and bikes. We're proposing uh, about a 5% reduction in parking from what zoning requires for the total of these four buildings because we think that's in keeping with where everyone is going in terms of trying to have more shared efficiency amongst the parking. Um, let's see, I think that was I'm just looking, I made some notes while you were talking because I wanted to make sure that we were uh, answering some of those questions. Um, so thinking about this building specifically, is how can we create a building on the corner that's iconic, that starts to uh, represent publicly the changing direction of this um, office park? So these are just some simple diagrams where we started to uh, relate to the existing site issues of the grade change, 
um, the FAR of the building, how we could uh, introduce some parking in that half uh, hidden sort of terrace level on the east side, put the main office floor at grade on 55th, and then how do we handle the internal circulation? I think the real key element is that final form um, where we're actually taking our second egress stair from inside the building and putting it on the outside of the building. So as you come from the lower level on the east and wrap uh, the south side of the building for first floor access and then continue on up to the second floor for second floor access, now that becomes a feature, that becomes a marquee. Um, it provides some opportunity for us to have more greenery, more planting, this outdoor uh, amenity that can be shared by other users of the park, not just this building, it starts to become that first public node that we can create that hopefully then we can sprinkle other instances of this throughout the park. And this becomes an opportunity potentially for a B-cycle, it's near the, uh, the bus stop, um, some other things that start to feed people into uh, the office park. So. Um, from the other side, well, this kind of section from the south side, you know, how do we plant that? How do we do some um, rain gardens that capture some of the runoff? We're, somebody was talking about pervious, impervious. We're actually decreasing the amount of pervious area in the aggregated sites um, and increasing the amount of impervious area through a combination of new planting, uh, some rain gardens, some permeable pavers in some of the parking areas and some things like that to start to work in that direction. Um, and then you can see here from this um, aerial from the southeast, now we've got this real um, quasi-public uh, amenity element that anchors this corner, starts to draw people in from the high traffic 55th Street, both pedestrian, um, uh, bikes, vehicular, into the site, at least into these first four buildings, and then part of the next step will be then how do we expand that in subsequent uh, project opportunities. So that's down and dirty. We're here for feedback, so I, as always, look forward to hearing what you guys uh, think about what's going on out here. Thank you, Kelly. Anyone got questions for Kelly at this point? It hurts to see that much roof without any pretty solar panel images on them. <laughs> that was one of my notes. I forgot to mention it. Um, because it's funny, it came up in one of our most recent conversations regarding um, uh, just the mechanical systems and the, the cost of this building relative to its size and some of those things. And one of the things that we've done at, um, w which building did we do that on? On 5541, where we actually did provide um, a modest PV array that allowed us to um, use a different, um, to provide heat for the mechanical systems rather than an electric or, uh, or gas uh, source which was really energy efficient, helped us meet some of the energy requirements and also provided that added benefit of the renewables. So I think we're, um, we're, we're open to that. We haven't rendered it um, in our representation. We'd absolutely allow for it. We may actually have to feel like we need to proactively pursue that a little further than we have to this point, so. And even if it's a lease deal where another operator comes on and puts them on, I don't mm -hmm. know why we're not seeing more of that, but it's a nice, development on the site for sure and I like the permeable paver pads and the gathering places and sometimes um, putting food up there even though it's not the right climate for year-round growing is uh, you know even better than the solar sometimes yeah. so, <coughs> questions for now and we'll come back to comments okay. um, but I did have a follow-up question which was um, you know we saw the commons and then we've seen some other concept uh, that was in Boulder Junction mm -hmm. that came in with kind of commercial net zero or close to it and you know question of whether you've thought about that really as a follow-up to Peter's question if this is anchoring the kind of development it's anchoring on 55th Street is that something you you guys would consider I think it's something we would consider I mean we're we pursue all options you know we, we start with what we need to meet in terms of Boulder's requirements what can we meet in terms of either uh, market demand or uh, value add for uh, as, as a venture? And then beyond that, what can we do to make a statement? And where along the spectrum the overall economics of this building 
will allow us to go is kind of yet to be determined, but we haven't ruled anything out at this point. We're early enough in the concept um, that we have a lot of flexibility to, to take input and to put things on the table and see how they fit. Great. Any other questions? Terrific. Thank you, Kelly. Fine. You guys are you tired? Hey, we're not done yet. No, we are. <laughs> I have a lot of words, okay. but they're not questions. That's that's right. We'll we'll get we'll back to, get back to comments. Okay. But first, uh, this is notice for a public hearing. So, um, Cindy, do we have anybody signed up? No. Would anybody from the public like to address us? We have Welcome. a speaker. All right. Yeah, if you could just fill out the card and make sure you introduce yourself. Yeah, I will. Kurt Nordbeck, 777 Delwood Avenue. I uh, work for Conica Minolta Systems Laboratory, which for about 12 years up until a few months ago uh, was located at 5775, 5775 Flatiron Parkway. So in Flatiron Park, just sort of around the corner from this location. So I've walked and bicycled past here thousands of times uh, in my long years there. Uh, and so I think, uh, obviously, this is a huge improvement over the building that's there, which is not saying very much. Um, I, I think that this is an opportunity for a really strong corner there at, at Central and 55th, and I feel like it doesn't really make the strong statement at the, at the corner that it could, uh, partly because of the large setback from Central. And I also think that there's a, there's a tremendous dearth of retail options there, as you know. There's now, uh, I guess thanks to these guys, Ozo and Upslope, which is great, and there's the Flatiron Deli, but that's it. And I've eaten at the Flatiron Deli more times than you want to know. <laughs> um, and so it would be really great to have some kind of retail at that corner, so a little coffee shop or, or a cafe or something like that. Um, obviously, residential would also be fantastic. I, I realize that that's a, a little bit more of a, of a pull, but uh, my office has about 18 to 20 people on site, and there are three of us who live in Boulder, uh, and everybody else drives in from Longmont, Erie, Superior, wherever, and um, so, you know, there's obviously demand in this particular area for residential of some sort, um, so if there were a mechanism for that, that would be fantastic. Uh, in terms of, there was a question about, uh, about paid parking, and I'm the world's large greatest fan of paid parking and some principles, but I think that this whole area is way overparked. When my building was completely full, there wasn't a single square foot empty there were still all kinds of, of empty parking spaces in the, the parking lot surrounding us. And so I'm concerned that if paid parking is required here, it would just overflow onto other sites. And so I think paid parking would absolutely be great and managed parking, but it needs to be done on the whole, the scale of the entire Flatiron Park. Um, and uh, last thing is about connectivity. It would be great, obviously, to have better uh, pedestrian permeability through here. Crystal, I appreciated your comments about that on the last uh, topic, the, the, the 22nd Street. Um, the, my, my, the people in my office would go out for walks to try to get some exercise, and you're always doing the same loop because there's only one place to walk. And so having more options and a better, just, just better permeability would be fantastic. So I appreciate you paying attention to that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Norbeck. Uh, anybody else from the public like to address the board? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for um, discussion. We usually don't have the matrix um, that we have mm -hmm. sometimes had um, but we do have um, the key issues, and one question would be if anyone wants to add particular issues on there or whether we want to just kind of go down the aisle and offer thoughts. I like the idea of just going down the aisle and offering thoughts, but kind of with that last rendering up there would be kind of nice instead of that. Okay. Don't mind. Those are pretty easy to remember. Elaine, do you remember yeah. which rendering that was? Yeah. Um, I bet you I could find it. 
That was at Southeast View that um, a little more Kelly just had up. Maybe we just flip back to Kelly's. There you go. That one there. Um, well, do you want to get us started then? Uh, sure. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I'd echo pretty much everything that Kurt said. Um, the, uh, I think a lot of the key issues here are how to, which you already said, Kelly, um, how to innovate the next generation of what happens out there. And it's, it's a huge opportunity. And, you know, I think, you know, the, the obvious things are, you know, how do you interweave, um, you know, useful things for the people who are inhabiting those spaces out there for those 8, 10, 12 hours a day. And so maybe, you know, getting a market study to look at what kind of retail will be supportable out there, that might justify a tendency on some of these projects. I don't know what kind of competition you have for those floor plates. I kind of imagine that people would like to have all of them and not lose corners out for retail, but um, maybe that would be better for everybody if, if they did. Um, I think this corner uh, on the main floor here facing the southeast kind of screams out for um, some kind of community space, whether it's uh, a cafe or... Um, you know, co-working, some kind of spill out innovative thing or something that comes out of the, the office itself, uh, just program wise, I think that would be really important. Um, I think the, the nature of the streetscape, I think is really key in this area too. Um, you know, are we gonna try to reverse the super deep setbacks of urban patterns and try to make a tighter street, streetscape or not? Um, I haven't gone through the use tables on this, so I don't know what all kinds of things you can stick in there uh, within the confines of that. And also a question for Elaine, is it possible, I don't think it is, but uh, to vary the FAR, there's no way of exceeding that, right? That's correct, not okay. for ID. And, and as a quick point of reference, um, restaurants in industrial zones would need to be associated with um, industrial, um, be a tap room services, or a tasting room. Industrial services. And so it's a little bit uh, different approach than what we're seeing right here. Mm -hmm. um, there's limited retail as well, just as a point of reference on the use. Right. So maybe part of this evaluation um, is going to inform future city policy about what we need to do to change those zones because we're hearing a whole bunch of stuff from the group up here and from the people who live out there and work out there that isn't being provided by those zones. And at the same time, those things wouldn't erode the much needed um, job base and industrial space that we're looking for out there. It actually enhance it and make it more valuable, more useful. So I, I do think it's really important that we like keep in mind that, you know, as a city, we need to stay uh, pretty complete and have um, things that are not always like, um, you know, Pearl Street or Mapleton Hill. But, uh, you know, there's got to be something better than Flatirons Parkway out there. And I think you're <laughs> getting in the right direction. Um, I think the other, um, the other thing I think that would be really good to look at is, is to help us um, evaluate residential in the area. And, like, how would that really work here? And, and what would really work? Um, does it belong along the major thoroughfares, or is it tucked away along a green space? Is it on the ground floor somewhere kind of cloistered off, or is it on top of these buildings? You know, what, what really makes sense? Um, I, I like the configuration of the site for the most part, um, and I think that, you know, the porosity of it and the sculpted nature of it I think are really fantastic. And the, the more occupiable, interesting spaces you can make around these buildings, the better. Um, so that's, I'll just stop rattling on at that point. You got us started. Cool. Uh, who else would like to would like to go next? Liz. Sure, I can go next. So I like what you did with fifty five forty one. That's awesome. Um, so I thought when I saw it, I thought I hope it's the same people who are doing this building because <laughs> I it thought that was such a nice uh, building compared to what's there now. So just that first remark, but. Um, my thing is always well is often the wetlands flood drainage type issues and I think um, you know redevelopment along this dry creek number two wetland could be looked at as an opportunity to create a more natural buffer um, and a more natural edge I think the fact that it is it is dead straight is like a not kind of Another example of a 1960s approach to development in a office park. And we've got this beautiful wetland and it's got this buffer line that has to be preserved. And the line just happens to be 
perfectly straight where, you know, in real life, a wetland, it's almost like a, a stipulated wetland buffer instead of an actual functional wetland buffer. And I thought, while you're in here, um, maybe something to consider would be ways to maybe take out some of the parking lots and have these fingers of the wetlands kind of come up into the park or have lawns or whatever, trees, clusters of trees, landscaping that would um, connect down into the wetland and just make it a more sort of natural and less artificial channelized kind of wetland looking thing. Um, and I think that um, that approach also would increase the permeability or the perviousness of the site, reduce the imperviousness of the site. And um, so the, the approach would not be to um, you know, add more buildings instead of parking lots, but to add more um, sort of drainage and natural areas instead of parking lots. Um, and my next point was that um, the connectivity, you know, within the site, I don't think that's as critical as how do you get to the site, and I don't know if that's anything that you guys can actually deal with, but um, it was scary trying to get there yesterday. I mean, I had to ride on the 55th Street sidewalk because it was I was there at 5 o'clock, and everybody's coming out, and it's just this crazy traffic, and, and you don't see bikes. I didn't see very many bikes, and so the drivers don't expect to see bikes, <laughs> you know, because it's this kind of self-fulfilling thing where it doesn't feel safe, so people don't ride, so people don't expect to see riders, and, and so this person just practically slammed right into me, and we, it was very scary. So anyway, um, if there's a way to improve access to this side of 55th Street from the creek path, I know you've got the railroad tracks in the way, uh, and I know it's not, it's really more of a city issue than um, the, this property owner's issue, but um, I think, anyway, I just think there's a, it's, somebody needs to address <laughs> how difficult it is to get there by bicycle. Um, I think that's, those are all my comments on the site. I think I, I like the building that you've proposed and um, the materials and and all the green space, so. Great, thank you, Liz. Mm -hmm. Who else would like to go? Harmon? Um, so, yeah, I don't have many comments. I think it's a, it's a pretty handsome building. Um, could use uh, some more, um, opportunities for uh, getting closer to net zero, either through skylights, solar on the roof. We talked a little bit about that. And also, um, you know, here we're seeing a, a great shadow over the east facade of the building. So it's like afternoon, later afternoon light. Um, but it doesn't look like there's much of a roof overhang on the uh, south facade of the building. Um, and you definitely get some of that effect from the covered walkway staircase, but not from the actual roof. And um, I think we we generally do a not as, as, as good a job as we should in Boulder development circles in providing for shading um, from our 300 days of sun that we get every year. And we lose the opportunity for passive solar in our buildings um, by that, and I think for a building of this size and scale, um, it would change the, the feel of the building, but um, having some kind of roof overhang um, would uh, also contribute just to the longevity of, of the building and protection for the walls and, and the materials, gaskets around your windows, things like that. I think it's just generally a good practice in a place that receives a lot of sun and a lot of snow. Um, I like the sunken court and, you know, it looks like you might have some good uh, infiltration opportunities with the green space strategically located. Uh, got to applaud that. And 
I, I think the building's handsome. I like the uh, the breakup of the design with the the little modules on the um, the all glass modules on the um, south east and uh, northeast corners. I like how the one on the northeast corner is two stories and the one on the southeast corner is only one. Um, I like the rhythm of the windows and the way that they're in set. Um, not too deep, but enough to let you know their windows and the materials look as good as I'd expect, you know, on a drawing. But, um, but I, I think they would probably look good the way you've got it programmed out in terms of just being solid materials and, and you know, we're not, I, I don't think we're looking at a stucco building here. Um, so that's about it for now. Great, thank you, Harmon. Crystal, do you wanna? Sure, well, I agree with what everybody said and Brian, you kicked it off nicely and Liz and Harmon. Um, I think this really, and, and, and by the way, the building next door to this is really wonderful. If you did it, congratulations. Oh, you did it, Andy great. <laughs> the creative force at Oz behind everything oh, that's going on. That is, is so. yeah, it's such a joy to see. And this corner, I have to tell you, I've gone by it and laughed because it's got that weird sidewalk and the berm and everything. So I like the concepts. I like what you're doing. When we talk about the public realm, this is a great example. Usually someone puts in a few trees and says, well, you know, I'm shading the building, but this is really nice. But I want to say if we stop back, if we step back and look at the big picture, there's a wonderful regional context picture or um, figure in our packet. And it just shows this whole site is surrounded by green and all the green kind of starts linking together if you ignore the roads and roads like Arapaho. But there's just such an opportunity to use that and build on some of those could be connections, including the railroads. We always forget about the railroads, but go to any town and you'll see a pathway along the the railroad tracks, whether it's fit in. I mean, they're all fit in after the fact, of course. And um, so anyway, it's something that we haven't done a lot with, but we could do more with. Um, and maybe, and then we also, I think the planning board of challenges to be proactive with some of the concepts, helping to implement some of the concepts that have come up as part of the planning, um, the Boulder Valley comp plan, and like Kurt mentioned, more rest, restaurants, places to live, et cetera. But maybe we can contribute to making that happen, people taking some ownership and maybe even just convening some discussion groups around that and then come up with some ideas and and uh, give them to the planning <laughs> the planning director that's sitting out there but I'm just saying that if we want some of these things to happen I think we're going to have to prioritize them and put in a little bit of energy into them and I know there are members of the community that would be very interested so I think you're headed in the right direction with this and um, look for, oh, I have one more question. I mean, I really have a, this is a big comment. So there's, um, it's in the 500 year floodplain. So you have one level of parking sort of at grade and then you have another one below. Oh, you don't. Good. So if you want to address that. Yeah, the parking is that grade on the east side. Okay. It's below grade on the west face. So we're just we're just cutting it into the berm, into the hill. So there's nothing below below grade. There's just that kind of walkout parking. Okay, on the so east you're side. not going to create a situation where um, occupants of the building would be trying to leave in a flood. And what do you want to do? Jump in your car and <laughs> drive right through the high hazard zone. None of that. Okay. Great. David, then Peter. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, uh, first of all, I, um, 
I don't want to just repeat everything that Liz, especially Liz, I mean, it sounded like you covered a lot of the points that I was going to cover, so um, I will try not to repeat everything, maybe just put my own slant on them, but um, I agree with um, pretty much everything that's been said. Um, I, I'll just mention the materials echoing the 5541 property, which um, will provide a, a real nice kind of, uh, uh, kind of cohesive look and feel to the area, and I really noticed that when I was walking the site and then holding my plans up and then looking at the existing building. At uh, 5541, so that was cool. Um, let's see. So, and um, also the corner was mentioned uh, earlier by the uh, comment. Um, uh, and the one thing I really like, I mean, uh, about that corner is that outdoor staircase and the idea that when you get to the corner, you'll see life, you know, going on uh, in this building, that there's actually, uh, it, it just seems to have a lot of life to it. Uh, the, uh, the, that corner, so that that just struck me uh, as as a positive uh, with the design. Um, so with the. Um Circulation, um, I have to say I really agree with the staff recommendations on the circulation. I think it's pretty uh, pretty much uh, comprehensive in, you know, the package that we got with regards to especially pedestrian. Uh, but as I, um, and then as I looked um, at this uh, master plan uh, link that was provided in the package and as I was looking at plan things, um, like Crystal was saying, there's really great possibilities. Dry Creek Dish number two, if you look up at Flatiron Parkway, there's actually the start of a multi-use path going along the west side of that of that creek that goes along a parking lot and then just ends. But if, if that whole west side of the creek has a multi-use path on it, it could go all the way up to the Boulder Creek path, basically, and then potentially, of course, there's a railroad in the way, which is a problem, but uh, down to Arapaho. Uh, but so I that really s sounds cool. Uh, so you'd be able to get to the Boulder Creek path going north, and then if you went, if some of these future connections to the multi-use path on the east side were built from central on the east side, you'd have uh, ways to get over there and uh, head over towards uh, um, oh, what is it, Old Stage Road area and all those areas. So that's, uh, so, and then uh, East Boulder Rec Center. So there's all these uh, wonderful connections that you could get. So I would really look at whether there could be that um, just to the east, east side of the property, whether there, there could be a multi-use path started just along that um, as part of this. Um, what else? Sump. I'll just make the comment that I kind of agree with the comment that a paid might be a little bit uh, complicated for this, um, but certainly shared unbundled with a little bit of management uh, could be um, a good start at least. Uh, but I do agree. And when you're out this far from the center of a city, paid becomes a little bit. Uh, a little, un unless you're actually just charging your lease, the people who lease the space, I don't know how it would actually work. So, uh, but definitely, I was happy to see all the discussion of some principles in there. Um, and finally, I'll just uh, oh, uh, I'll mention uh, the this idea of um, wetlands uh, replacing parking with wetlands is really interesting, and five percent parking reduction is not that high, actually. So um, if, if you decided to take a parking lot out and put in a, a little uh, permeable space, uh, I think that at least I would be very warm to that idea. So I like that. Um, and finally, um, just on the, um, yeah, anything, I, I realize there's limitations based on the zoning, but um, retail and live work are always really interesting uh, for us to start to move into. Um, as I, I realize that live work is, is maybe a little difficult here, but um, any kind of retail, any kind of uh, uh, business uh, addition would be, would be of interest. So that's it. Great. Peter? I like it. I like the, uh, I think it's great. And I think that the corner is well served by this open space as opposed to holding the corner because of what it is. Um, I assume that a, a tenant that's going to go in here is going to have their own kitchen and cafe at least to feed their workers. In that case, there's going to be some amount of venting that's going to happen. And that's where I think it's pretty easy to create a small cafe with an espresso machine and some packaged goods or anything that things don't even really need venting. But that kind of, I just, 
I feel pretty sure that any tenant's gonna go in here and create an employee cafeteria environment, and so if you could pair that up in some way with that retail, I think that it would be a hit, and I think that it would help establish this corner as kind of a hearth, and I think there's plenty of places to do it. Um, that's not my decision of where, but I just agree that more retail out there is better. And I think, you know, healthier options and the ability for people to to eat on site and to gather and to meet with each other. You get a lot of these buildings where I feel like everyone just hangs out inside with their coworkers. And to have a third place that's public where they could get some food or something would be great. Um, and then I agree with all the net zero comments. Again, a the tenants moving into this area and moving into Boulder will pay, will pay the freight for that. And I think it can be done without breaking the bank. And I think that there's no reason not to. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, I think most of what I would have said has already been brought up, so I'll just bring a few more to pick up on the kind of retail sort of theme. Um, one other thing to look at on this corner in this patio, because I think you're going to want to show life on that patio, are probably two things. One, think about some sort of outdoor retail, you know, kiosk -y, like you'd find in an Eastern city or European city or something else like that. Doesn't have to be all the way to a food truck, um, but something that's going to keep people outside and, you know, you can have some of that that it's going to be not the coldest day of the winter, but um, you know, robust enough that people will be out there 10 months out of the year, maybe um, certainly on the nicer days. And then the other piece that I think, given that if, if you're not gonna have the strong corner with the building itself, a really strong piece of art or recreational amenity, a sculptural piece or something else like that would really kind of rock this corner. And maybe a boulder as a bouldering feature or a few bouldering features um, that would, uh, whether they're real or artificial, would probably really um, be loved by the attraction, be a real focal point. Um, there may be better ideas, but that, that's just one, um, just to kind of um, light that up. I know there's liability and other things you have to worry about, but um, my guess is with materials and size, you could probably work around some of those. Um, it would be really nice to see the context of an overall master plan that you're working at to help understand some of the flood issues, the circulation issues. I'd love to see a kind of a um, move into the future on parking because I agree it's over parked and something should be done with the parking. It'd be nice to see a kind of plan for that and some of it may be the kind of green space that Liz talked about and I think David talked about. Um, some of it may be, um, you know, moving into housing. Some of it may be, there may be some art or other kind of spaces in there that could be made available to community organizations. We'd have to make sure the FAR pieces work, but maybe that's an opportunity too for code changes um, to ena enable some of those sorts of things. And as we're looking at community benefit that's tied in with art or affordable retail or affordable business or other sort of things. There may be some opportunities there that you can't do right this minute, but if you have a plan and can help show us why we should make those changes, it, I think it helps make that case. Um, and then the other piece is on floodplains, that if you're looking at the connections, thinking about maybe some changes on roads and um, bike and ped and other sort of connections, you know, think about making sure that enough of those are elevated so that there's a way to have internal and external circulation, um, even during some of those flood events, um, which I think is good for safety. I think it gives people a sense of security and actual security. You're not a critical facility. It's not currently required. Um, but I think some of that would be good practice if you've got the site open anyways, and maybe doing some cutting and filling here and there, it might be a good way to use, bless you. Um, some of that in a way to, you know, provide those um, <laughs> refugia and connections in a way that would be robust and resilience, uh, resilient in an event. And then think about maybe sites for um, things like energy storage and other sort of things that I don't think would count against FAR, but would be a good use um, for some of that space. And there are a lot of opportunities out there, given the industrial <laughs> nature of that, to, you know, it, maybe a microgrid in the future, maybe some storage, maybe some other sort of renewable energy or other sort of pieces. I'm not sure that 
that's this corner, um, but as part of a master plan, looking for those spaces and making sure that you've got room to do the kind of cool stuff that I think tenants 20 years out, maybe 10 years out, are going to look at. Um, and then along with the reduction in parking, an increase in pedestrians and that sort of thing, thinking about how to accommodate more um, ride share services and um, you know, whether it's aut autonomous cars or Lyft and Uber and other sort of things, and are we best accommodating those uses or making long trips, burning fuel, burning electricity, whatever it is, to get in and out of those sites and make sure we're th thinking about that, which I think is going to be increasing a lot faster than the, um, um, you know, the parking needs would be, uh, and think about ways that you can take that abundance of asphalt that's not really doing you or your clients or tenants any good and turning into things that'll be amenities for them. So, Peter? Uh, one last thought on the possible possibility there's an exclusivity for coffee based on Ozo being there and things like that. I'm just not sure um, in the interest of being helpful and not just saying stuff that makes sounds good right now, but I know there's realities on the ground. Um, but light art on the corner is a great idea. Light art would be kind of cool. So um, with that, I think we covered a fair amount of ground. We often do a summary. If you'd like, I can do that. If you'd prefer, also, I think you've got it. And I think Cindy's got it as well. So save the time on that. But if you've got any follow-up questions um, or any other pieces that you just want to leave us with, um, Please take that opportunity. Um, well, I just, I'm encouraged by, I think, especially the way you just closed it. I think we, both as a profession globally, but particularly on this site, with Crescent and their interest in the site, with the types of tenants that they're attracting, I think we're all on the same page. We're excited about it. I mean, Amanda's been working there for six years trying to improve everybody's life in that park and we see tremendous potential to achieve a lot of these things and we're dealing with some pretty serious restrictions even on what types of office tenants can go into the buildings or what types of uses or the limitations on on retail and all the things that we think would make this a more dynamic and diverse neighborhood and further all of these ideals so we're on board with it i think We'd be anxious, I think, if we get to a point where we have a master plan that really explores some concepts and raises some serious questions and some serious issues to work with Elaine or somebody to try and find uh, a vehicle for, you know, I don't know if it's a neighborhood overlay, I don't know if it's selective zoning, I don't know if it's certain conditions and, and waivers that allow for um, things in return for, for, for moves on our part, but Whatever it is, you know, having a, the opportunity to, to maybe bring that forward in some form or fashion and get this kind of feedback and input because those guys would love to put residential on the site. <coughs> At certain um, limitations, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's got to be enough there there to make some of this worthwhile and really make a, a, a meaningful change. And then that feeds more retail, it creates more opportunity, all those things come into play. So that's what we're working on as well. We're going to keep doing these incremental steps, trying to improve this place piece by piece and hopefully at each step along the way we can move along that agenda. But if we have a big vision um, and we had buy-in and we could think through how to best facilitate that with us and the city, I think it would be tremendous. I think it would set a real example for what's possible in other parts of the city. So. Yeah, I, th I think that's totally true. And I think speaking for the board, I'm sure we'd find a way to um, meet with you on that and have a study session outside of the context of a specific project, which I'm sure we can figure out a way of doing. Um, because I think, you know, if you can solve some of the urbanism and sustainability issues with this neighborhood, it's going to be a huge, huge deal for Boulder. Mm -hmm. And we've got a lot of opportunities to get this wrong. And if we can get it right in the first couple chunks, it's going to be really, really fantastic. And it's got to be an analysis that gets, it got, it's got to color outside of the lines. You know, the use tables and the FAR limits and some of the difficulties you're going to face in terms of land use code are going to make it. I mean, that zoning is 
what drives it to be like it is now, and it's horribly unsustainable. And if you're going to get away from being horribly unsustainable, you're going to have to break all those rules. Yes, one quest, uh, a protocol question, maybe Hella could answer, but um, one of the things that we're doing is we're reaching out to brokers that are trying to place tenants in, in Boulder. We're reaching out to tenants that are um, looking for space. We're, look, we're reaching out to the, the building owners, not just Crescent, but some of the other owners of the buildings in the park, trying to ask some questions about you know what's missing, what would make it better, what would you be looking for, what kinds of things. We, we need, so we'd like to get some of that input from the city in some capacity as well. I don't know if it's this group or body. Actually, but one, one great vehicle for that would be the city has uh, just awarded an RFP for Open Space Mountain Parks to relocate all their offices about a block and a half from here. So maybe we could just ask Open Space. We'd talk to Open Space and Mountain Parks. But I think, you know, I think if there, was a, if there was a way for, through a lane or somebody to, like, feed you guys informally uh, a questionnaire that asks some questions that just get more input from your perspective, I think it would help inform some of the things that we're, we're investigating, so. And yeah, I think the key, the key thing for us is because you'll be back to us presumably for a site review, or at least maybe a call up on a site review, we have to be careful right. that it's not an ex parte communication. But on things like the use tables and other sort of things, we every year ask council to consider making some of those changes and to have more detail because people have looked at particular zones as opposed to we're looking at all the zones at once to say here are you know some key fixes that would you know allow more flexibility to do things so that that can work its way into the legislative process so that when it's there we're not necessarily stuck with the kind of tables that we have oh. went on site review so you know put that in uh, Harmon and then Peter so, you know, it's heartening to hear you talk like that. My, um, my first planning mentor, um, paraphrasing Chairman Mao, which may be appropriate in the People's <laughs> Republic of Boulder, once said that planning is a long march. And what we saw in the 2015 comp plan update was the addition of policies around walkability, 15-minute neighborhoods, resilience, sustainability, and yet we didn't make the changes to tables and limits that would actually allow for those things to happen. And, you know, I've been exhorting staff to be flexible and to start looking at ways. We, we added a policy in the, um, in the comp plan actually around trying to find a, a neighborhood that would be will, a willing pilot for doing some sensitive infill of multifamily and uh, mixed use on strategic locations like street corners where collectors meet. Um, so that you could get a cup of coffee in an otherwise currently residential monoculture. And, uh, and I think that, you know, this is something that we don't have a provision for what you're asking for. I mean, uh, the, the height limit's not what's driving the two-story design, it's the FAR. And with, you know, what Brian calls is an unsustainable 0.5 FAR, which requires a lot of parking, um, essentially, or, or open space, we're not getting there. We're not, we're not going to have a, an office park where we have live work and where we have retail and where we have a place to go get lunch as well as go to your job and then go home without using your car. And so, you know, I would, I would again exhort staff to look for an opportunity for pilot projects if we can't go and make wholesale changes. Um, pilot projects, you know, minor uh, zoning amendments where, you know, we, we get a map amendment that doesn't require a land use map change but only a, a zoning change to boost an FAR to the point where we can do something different on a site that needs it in an office park that, you know, at this point is really monochromatic and needs some color. Um, you know, you've got a, uh, a person here who's actually saying that his notion of um, thinking big isn't, you know, blasting through the 55-foot height limit. It's just getting a little bit of residential and, and commercial on an industrial site, which I think is quite reasonable for a city that considers itself a place that wants to have 15-minute neighborhoods. Peter? Well, yeah, I agree. I think it would be a disgusting waste if we didn't push for these kinds of changes on this site, given everything else that's happening in Boulder. And you look at the direction, the path of progress, and why there can't be housing here. There's, there's, if the only reason is these tables, and I get to still be the new guy and say that, well, that's, that's idiotic. No, you We're here to fix things, that. even the old guy. So yeah, I think we should get bold on this. 
Crystal? Well, just as a reminder, the comp plan it does have an action plan, and that was when we started the comp plan process. People have said, or people said, in the past, there was no action plan to make things happen with our policies. So um, you have to hand it to the to the comp planners because they really listen to that, and those are the next steps. So I know city council will probably jump in there and um, prioritize the actions they want to see, but maybe we could preempt them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, give them a list of some actions that we we see. And the use tables are very important, but they are m more important for the areas of stability, but the areas that are changes, that's how you can get things to happen. So, so one last comment, David, and then we oh, I was just going to say it's a good time to jump on the action plans. Yeah. Uh, since it, the, it just got approved, so it's a good time to be involved in that. So thank you very much. Thanks for an interesting concept. Thanks for an interesting, strong Hopefully first step here. Stimulates some thoughts about some opportunities um, in this part of town. And uh, as always, enjoy the interaction and appreciate the feedback. So we'll thank take it to heart and see what we can come back with. We'll look forward to it. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I think that now brings us to matters from the planning board, planning director, and city attorney. Um, I believe this is our last September meeting, believe it or not, um, before I'm sure we're going to get back. What's that? That's amazing. It is amazing. I don't want to. Don't jinx it. I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> um, but if anyone had any, raise it, any issues to raise, now's the time to do it. And see anything from Jim. Hello, Cindy. We're good. Good night. Um, I may mention one thing. Yes. There are, as you said, there are no meetings in the next three weeks. I think there will be a few call-ups coming through, and I think staff's trying to send them out on Friday so that they don't uh, come in any day, but watch out for those in your emails, and if you have any questions about them, don't hesitate to contact staff yeah. or me. To Thank, piggy Thank you. To piggyback on that, I did get an email while we're sitting here from Carl Geiler, and there will be a call-up going out tomorrow. Um, regarding attention homes, 1440 Pine. Okay. So Great. please watch your emails for Subdivision that. Subdivision plat. And then, Hella, I wanted to, we thanked you by email, but thank you again for putting together that guidebook on forms of conditions. That's, yeah. I think, really helpful and will be a good legacy piece that will, I'm sure, inform and help planning boards many years into the future. So oh, we missed the so much to use them tonight. We still <laughs> <laughs> all of them. Uh, so much know? struggling yeah. over wording that we won't have to do. No, I, I, I used it so in, in sorry. <laughs> I, I used it in my friendly that you okay. you didn't accept. He blew it out of the water. <laughs> I, I pulled yeah, right. I pulled a uh, I pulled a transform on the um, dab uh, uh. condition and turned it into a landmarks board condition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but I used it as a framework, so thank you, Helen. And thank you, Elaine, for jumping on the the, um, the issue of, of proper notice. And I'm sure you worked with Helen on that, um, both of you. So thanks, Steph, for um, yeah, just being you. Johnny on the spot. When things come up, you know, we, we get a lot of, um, you know, emails that, that might not be phrased in the most polite way. Um, and, and then you just provide answers. And I think that's really wonderful and commendable. Not that you. you're... Or not the, who, who, <laughs> one of us was the one who said there was no notice, but that was phrased in that a That was way. me. I said there was no notice, polite, but I didn't think you're very polite. You're very polite. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you called it and we, we addressed the issue. Let's quit while we're ahead. Um, yeah. Any other matters, Cindy? I just want to let you all know I won't see you until the end of October. So wow. please be kind to the person wow. over here. Enjoy Antarctica. So, uh, I wish. No. I'm. We'll tell you later what I'm doing. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm on the same schedule, so uh, I, I'll, I will be back for the second October meeting. Mm. Um, Great. Well, with that, Harmon. <laughs> so we better go um, somewhere. <laughs> pretty sure we have a meeting in the first week of October. I will not be in town, so if we can get that on somebody's schedule, uh, I'm going to be out of town um, during. Already down two is. then. So You're out so of town then too. No, I think. Uh, David just said yeah. oh, okay. he is, that, so we had to watch us. that one carefully. Is that all? I th was thinking there was someone else. I think I was a maybe, but for now I'm still I'm still on. October. What are the Thursdays? Uh, let's see. It's the fifth, isn't it? 
It is the 5th. 5th? It's October 5th yeah. and October 19th. Yeah, I'm planning to be there on the 5th. And then, I will be there on the 19th. Okay. Then just as, can I just bring up some yeah. general matter? Um, so, you know, one thing that our chair has been doing quite a bit over time um, is uh, asking applicants, what, what are your plans for all the parking that you're structuring um, in your development proposal, your site review, if, if in the future with the changes, Uber and Lyft and self-driving cars and the benefits of density and so forth, we don't need so much of, of that structured parking. Have you designed the structured parking in a way that it can be easily converted into other uses? Um, I, I sent John a, uh, a, a um, an article by an award-winning architecture critic for the Philadelphia Inquirer about how um, the usage rates in center city Philadelphia parking garages are going down despite the fact that the city population in what Philadelphians call center city, which is the downtown of Philadelphia, has gone, the population has gone from 40 or 50,000 when I was a kid to 100 plus thousand people with the construction of a lot of new condominiums, uh, the redensification of neighborhoods, gentrification of neighborhoods and conversion of office buildings into residential. Um, so it, it, it does speak to, you know, something that I think, you know, we're not even close to there yet in terms of Boulder, and, and with our code, we never may get there. But um, but the, the proof is at least in the pudding in Philadelphia, which is that when you reach a certain level of density, people stop using their cars. So to actually have doubled the population and decreased the use of parking garages. Um, at the same time that the, the zoning board, by the way, keeps approving projects, um, for row house development requiring garages and without alleys, those garages are on the front and take away street parking spaces. So, you know, you're looking at fewer street parking spaces, twice as many people and fewer people using the garages that have already been built. And the article's premise was that some of these garages are being converted to really cool housing and mixed use projects. It's on our radar, so we need to push it. And it was a great article, so it might be worth sending around the whole whole board. Yeah, if people would like it, I will. Yep. So, good. Well, with that, I'm going to adjourn, and we'll see everybody in early October. And you're Thanks, from everybody. Mike, Cindy. So there was kind of a deal.